Good to be with you on our President's Day coverage of America's Day of the Races on FS2. Thanks for being with us. Our program brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. Sun shining here in South Ozone Park, New York. We'll have live coverage from here at Aqueduct and at Oaklawn and Hot Springs. Greg Wolf, New York Racing Association handicapper, Andy Serling, trainer Carlos Martin. Good to have you back with us again. Looking forward to this latter half of the card ahead. We're going to hone in on that seventh race coming up. I thought the seventh race today came up an incredibly fascinating race. It's really one of those races where there aren't a lot of weak links. I think pretty much every horse in there, a case can be made for them. Layoffs, horses trying to get back their form, but some very, very interesting players. Very, very interesting race. We'll take a look at the field right here. Baba comes out, the rest remain. And we'll take a look at Royal Poppy for Ray Handel. Back-to-back -back second place finishes. What can put her over the hump today, Andy? Uh, I don't know. She's probably going to be stalking Stonewall star, star early. She's got to get back and run that big figure that she ran in the slop. Now, I don't think she's a horse to necessarily just jump forward in the slop, but she's got to show that she has another fast effort in there because right now she's kind of, Carlos, what Greg and I often refer to as a one-number horse. Yeah, no, I understand completely what you're saying, Andy. Sometimes those horses are hard to get back to, uh, to those kind of big efforts. I'm curious about the Agave Kiss Knowing back in the day when Mr. Lizza flying Z stable, what a great, great race, Marin. Give me a kisses. Certainly looks like she had a lot of talent early on. I'm kind of very interested to see her race again today. Carlos is, is referring to the dam of Give Me Kisses, who is a very nice runner here, who people remember breaking her maiden, I believe, on the inner track here in the winter for Rudy Rodriguez. We're going to have more on Dylan Davis. He's having a terrific meet leading the way at this winter meet here at Aqueduct, teaming up with Ray Handel. That's coming up later. Well, bring your races five through eight. Here's what's ahead, presented by Claiborne Farm. Fast in New York and fast going out in Hot Springs as well. We'll check with Paula Duca a little bit later on in the program. So all that coming up and more. Played all, of course, by getting signed up. Started with Naira Bats. New members get that $200 deposit match. Sign up bonus. There it is. This is what to punch in at sign up to take advantage. Match 200. You're good to go again at NairaBets.com. All right, let's check it at Oakland. Their fourth race, six furlong sprint. It's four-year-olds and up who have not won a race since September of last year or not winners of a race since July 19, allowed four pounds. The condition here, money run. Blinkers going on, Andy, for one of the best claiming barns in the country, certainly at Oakland, Robertino Diodoro. And we're seeing Diodoro barns starting to perk up a little bit. Not that they're having a bad meet, but it feels like when he's winning at under 20%, he's having a bad meet. Here's Drill's little man from the rail. Now coming in off a layoff from Prairie Meadows, and we have not seen those Prairie Meadows form get get transferred here that often. A speed from out of town. Lightning struck went by. Here's the three good scout. Uh, this is the horse that probably is going to be in front, but is moving up precipitously off a big win. 11 time winner at 7 to 2. They're WW crazy for John Ortiz. Unlike the number three, this horse is dropping down in class. Money run, 9 to 5. Favorite blinkers go on to 5. Should be in a good stalking position early, but even for Diodoro, you have a claim and a drop. Don't love those. Next door. Cowboy Cabin with K's here got a, since November. Got a big figure last time in November at Remington Park, but that was in a very low-level claiming race. Spite and Malice, second, or no, sorry, second start, third start with a new barn, Steve Hobby. Uh, I, can, I can respect this name in this race. <laughs> Didn't think it was impossible of his last couple of figs. And huge price outside, 28 to 1. This is Deflator with Chelsea Bailey. Would take a, a significant form reversal. So five minutes to post. Here in the fourth at Oaklawn, we're going to go live to Hot Springs. Check in for the first time on the program with Paula Duca. Hey, Paulie. Yeah, happy President's Day to you guys as well. And some Monday racing in Ozone Park and South Ozone Park. Uh, and also here in Hot Springs. And we get to race number four here. Nine race car. Don't forget race number five. We'll start your pick five. And when you look at the body of this field, uh, I'm in agreement with Andy that the three good scout probably gets to the front end in here. You know, there is a lot of speed in this race. Carlos Barbosa, the bug boy, got aboard this seven-year-old son of Oxbow last time out, carrying 112 pounds and just wired a field. Now Tommy Vanberg jumps his horse up. And I can see, I mean, this horse has shown tremendous speed, even in the Ronnie Cravens barn, um, who's located in Texas. He's a very good trainer. Jonas Gibson claimed this horse for the State and Flurry barn. Um, He's just very fast, but he's going to have to deal with some other horses in here. The one's pretty fast. Uh, you know, the five in here, money run, putting the blinkers on. Um, 
you know, a horse that was in the Steve Asperson barn at one time, uh, you know, I think the six obviously took a field gate to wire at a longer distance. I don't know if the six is fast enough in here, but when you look at the five money run, he's just really never been able to rate off any horse in past horses. Is he going to have to get towards the front or, you know, does he put away the three early? And that, that's kind of like why I like the seven spite and malice. Now the racetrack so far has played pretty fast. We had one race go 110 and change, but we've seen a couple horses come from off the pace. And I think this horse right here, Spite and Malice, is a horse that caught two muddy racetracks in the Steve Hobby barn, finally finds uh, or at least catches a dry racetrack where, you know, he is three for 13 lifetime. I get it. He was 0 for 7 last year. I just think he finds a right group here of horses that, you know, of the horses that want to pass, I just think he's the best. I think you're getting a great price here at 9 to 2. Paulie, thanks. And you, we saw both the five and the seven on the screen here just recently, both making a very nice appearance on the racetrack. What do you guys think here? Nine to two on this seven that Paulie seems to make a nice case for. What do we think? I don't know. You're the man who's given out like uh, big price exact, hold exactas, Greg. The question really is what you think. What, what do I think? Um, I would be more interested in the four if he wasn't so slow early. And it's hard to get a horse to win from far back, so I'd rather have horses like the three and five. They're going to be more forward. And I, I'm not going to make a big case, Carlos, against the five. I agree, Andy. I was looking at the four as well. He came out of a key race. A couple of those horses came back and won subsequently. And John Ortiz does such a great job. But the more I read these conditions of this race, horses that haven't won a race in September, uh, the three horse sneaks in there because he uh, won for under a, a certain amount of money. So I thought he was interesting. You know, have recency. A lot of these horses haven't won in a very long time, and the three horse just comes off that six, six length win in January. So I thought, you know, coming off that big win, he got into this race because he ran for under a certain price tag, and he has speed, and I love speed. This is a tougher spot for him, and he did win in a sealed track last time, but he is a horse that has back races to back that performance up, so it's not like it was just a, a fluky race necessarily on a wet track. Yeah, and look, there's other speeds in here too, and that's <laughs> one of the toughest things we talk about at Oakland here, not necessarily for good scout, but you have some others in this race, you know, like Cowboy Cabin, who just ran a big race out of town, different racetrack. How do you equate those those numbers? Do they fit here in Hot Springs? Watching shippers there, it does feel like the Remington Park shippers don't often reproduce that form. I think you have to get used to it. I think you could say the same for the one coming in from, from Prairie Meadows. But, you know, you're talking about positioning, the one is probably not as fast as the three, but because the one drills the little man is fresh and, and gets the rail, there may be an impetus for him to be aggressively ridden. Yeah, I agree. The, the one could definitely make the three's job uh, very, very difficult if he decides to gun from in there. How much, Carlos, did you, in your training career, I know still ongoing, do, do you let that just weigh on you and stress you out where you draw with horses or you just chips fall where they may? Yeah, I mean, it's so many times you, you overanalyze everything in this business. And when you have a great jockey and you kind of play the break, it, it, there's not much else you can do. You have a, a certain horse that has a certain running style. You kind of stick to what works. You try not to deviate from there. And like Andy always points out here, watching the show all these years, <laughs> there seems like there's so much speed in a race, and then everybody takes back. And so you have to play to your horse's strengths is primarily the thing that we try to do as trainers anyway. Well, you also see, I mean, I know a lot of trainers, they'll talk about they hate getting the rail first-time stars particularly. And, and I get it. I don't love it either. But the reality is the numbers don't back that up. We do see when firsters, if at the end of the day, your firster better be good enough. You know, like that's the biggest concern. Right. If you, if you have a good horse that can break fast and you're on the inside and you open up two on the field and you're kicking dirt back to a lot of horses that have, have never run as well, it's not a bad place to be. Definitely have an advantage. I mean, a lot of times it's almost worse to be outside in that open space because horses will break to that open space that MIG talks about a lot of the time. Get a little lost out there. I, you know, I don't, you know, there's so many things. They've standing in the gate a long time. I, I, over time, I just don't find that they, they really bear out that it's that relevant. At the end of the day, it's about the horses. And I think a lot of times we lose, all of us lose sight of that. Right, the great Alan Jerkins uh, used to say, 90% uh, horse and it's a horse racing at the end of the day. I remember Jerkins telling me many years ago, and I'm sure you talk to, to him quite often, that he said, I've lost many more races by under-training horses than I have over-training them. He was, he was some, some special, special guy. There's a horse running 
uh, hopefully soon that Charlie Baker has for some good friends of ours uh, called Remembering the Chief, uh, Army Mule, first time started. Really? It's been training well recently, so I'm excited to see him run, especially he brings back so many great memories. Uh, honoring great, yeah, Alan, great the man. great Alan Jerkins. Great By the way, coming up later in the show from Oakland, we're going to have a horse, 10-year-old, who has been a three-time participant in the participant in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, twice runner-up, CZ Rocket, yeah. showing up later today in the card. So we look forward to that Good scout coming up it. right now. It's fourth from Oakland. Let's go to Too Matt Dinnerman for the call. In WW Crazy. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, good scout in the middle of the pack going towards the lead. Money run up close to the pace as well. There's Money Warren in the white blinkers to stick the head in front. Deflator in the pink jacket moving up, claims second. Good scout taken back to third. Spite and Malice next with Thrill's Little Man and Lightning Struck. The first six separated by five lengths approaching the half mile pole. There's a gap of three to the two at the back. WW Crazy and Cowboy Cabin. They approach the four turn. Money runs, secures a clear lead into the four turn run. Streaks away to a two length lead as he starts to string him out now. Deflator running in the second spot. Good Scout has come under a little bit of a ride here. Spited Malice outside of him also shoved upon. Three back to Lightning Struck. Then Drills Little Man, Cowboy Cabot, and WW Crazy as they hit the quarter pole. Money Run, it's his race to lose, appears to be cruising down the lane. Money Run opens up four now. On the outside, Spite and Malice is coming on into second with Good Scout. Deflator calls it a day with about a 16th to go. It's Money Run and Christian Torres. Spite and Malice continues to close, but Money Run's too far in front for anybody to catch him. Money Run went right to the lead, never stopped. Spite and Malice was second, third, good scout. And I believe Lightning Struck just got up for fourth over WW Crazy. Meets leading rider Christian Torres. First off to claim, Robert Tino Diodoro Barn. The blinker's on. Money Run looked the part in the warm-ups. The resume as well, and he runs to it. Well, Carlos, I think your comment before the race was prescient. Sometimes it looks like the race is loaded with speed and one horse goes, and that's what happened here. Yeah, Diodoro can get really streaky here at Oakland. He can uh, get on a roll. Five to two, money run. That's a fourth win of his career as we check back in New York and the odds for the fifth one turn mile. New York Breds allowance optional claiming field. It kicks off the late pick four, Midtown Lights. The eighth, the seven of five favorite for Brad Cox. Let's head downstairs to Richard Migliori for more. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, hi, Carlos, Sandy, how you guys doing? We'll start with the four horse, Bonadou for Rudy Rodriguez, who really looks the part. And, and interestingly enough, the three horses I'm going to talk about, all the horses that look terrific from a physical perspective, but also make sense on paper. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that blend of who looks, catches your eye physically and matches up certainly with their form that uh, says they're good enough to win. The four Bonadou looks terrific, as most of Rudy's horses do. They're very well turned out. And I think she's just got a pace advantage as well. She looks very sharp, this daughter of Goat Sapper. She's run four times at the distance for two wins, two seconds. And I think she, potentially gets very loose here and very comfortable and she could not look any better. She gets Louis Rivera Jr. who is now a full-fledged journeyman rider, lost his apprenticeship uh, about four or five days ago and has actually won a race or two without the bug. So important for an apprentice when they lose their apprentice allowance to show people that they can win heads up with no weight allowance and uh, it's about getting opportunities. So nice that he gets to keep him out on a filly that he's had success with. Uh, Rudy showing confidence in Louis Rivera Jr. The eight horse Horse, your favorite looks terrific. Uh, I really think this horse came on from the race under her belt. Um, could take another step forward. It'll be interesting to see. Manny Franco is an aggressive rider. I don't think she has as much natural speed as the four Bonadou, but she uh, probably be in a stalking position. And I just wonder how early she goes to engage her because the other horse that really makes a great impression here is the nine Clover Street, who is a closer and needs pace to help uh, set up her late run have to talk about it though physically could not look any better particularly coming off of that winning effort last time uh, that was back in December doesn't look like she's lost any fitness uh, whatsoever and I just wonder if the eight and the four kind of hook up a little bit early will she benefit from them kind of picking things up in the middle of the race right now though I think Bonadou gets loose interested to hear what Andy thinks about that 
Well, I don't think there's any doubt if it's a clean break that Bonadieu is going to be in front. I mean, that's the way she runs, and she's clearly faster than the eight. I do agree with Richie that that Manny will try to get Midtown Lights into position, but it's hard to see her better than, se you know, second, I should say. And I'm not so sure that my first love and Eric Cancel will look for position down the inside as well, which I think is an overlay in here. That man right there making this jockey colony immediately that much deeper. Former champion jockey at Woodbine won the Queen's Plate back in 2022. Rafael Hernandez is going to be riding here all winter long. We'll have more on him when we come back on our President's Day coverage on FS2. Back with you on our President's Day coverage, America's Day of the Races on FS2. Greg Wolf, Andy Serling, Carlos Martin up here on the desk as we get set for the fifth, kicking off this light pig four here at Aqueduct. We'll start with my first love off since July of last summer. I think this is an interesting horse if you're looking for a bit of a price. Um, she may have just needed a break. Next door, distant third at this condition last start, Eros' girl. The problem with her is she doesn't have any race in there that looks good enough to get a major share. Freddie Mo Factor already has run three times this year, has not hit the board. Name for my good friend, Fred Moskowitz. She, uh, she's not as fast as he is. <laughs> bon adieu. You're going to get pace with this one. She's going to be in front, but she has had very fortunate trips against Lesser. I'm a little dubious. Here is April Antics, Matt Can Cantor Machi Barn. Feels like a horse that could definitely get a piece of this. Her good race has put her in the mix. And six to one right now, the three time winner. Carbon blinkers come off. Is, is it possible she's a wild card speed in this race, that she could be a little forward? Shown some speed in Times. the past, potentially. Amity Island at 12 to 1. A I, lot of seconds. Yeah, and I think like like the number 5, though not quite as good as April Annick, she's got to could be picking up pieces at the end. Here's Midtown Lights, a 7 to 5 favorite with Manny Franco. I like Midtown Lights, and no big great shake. She's a heavy favorite. She was wide, a little bit wide against a good rail last time. I thought she was very logical. Multiple stakes placed as well against New York Red Company. And then Clover Street on the outside coming off a win. Mig loved the way she looked. But, I mean, you look at the horses that can be picking a piece at the end. April Antics, Amity Island, and Clover Street. I'm not sure she's not the third fastest of that three. Meanwhile... Here's the speed of the field again, and Bon Adieu is going to try and say that to the rest of this group early on, try and make her win her third in a row, coming in off back-to-back -back Winsgate to wire. And we were talking about it a little earlier with um, Louis Rivera losing his bug. It'll be interesting to see how he makes the transition. Yeah, very nice, humble young guy, hard worker, and we've had some success, and he's definitely, uh, uh, for a young rider, 
he, he's, a, he's a horseman. You can see when he gets in the morning and works the horses, he can give you a good opinion. So I'm excited to see what he can do as a journeyman. Got himself a good agent in Jimmy Riccio, also has Kenner Carmouche's book. I just feel like she's been very opportunistic. Now, the third place finisher came back and won, obviously against Weaker, but the third place finisher was down towards the rail and riding a dead rail that day, where I thought Rivera did a very good job getting her out in the middle of the racetrack in a day. But she looks good and she is in good form, and I think that's a positive for her. Five-year-old mare, had, yeah, maybe just getting good at the right time right now? Uh, very, very, very likely well-bred mare. Danny Gargan does a great job. You don't see too many people move up. Rudy's done a tremendous uh, job with this with this mare. She's really in great form. I like the Andy's horse that he mentioned earlier in the show. The one, I think, is interesting at 7-1, to 10-1 to 1 morning line. Jimmy Ferraro, good old school horseman, has some back races that I think make her really, really interesting. Can't sell. Seems like he's getting hot again. Has three wins with this mare. And her figures definitely make her dangerous. I think at 7-1, to she offers a little value if you're trying to beat the uh, Brad Cox and Rudy. Loves this racetrack, too. She's 4 for 8 here. Talking about the one, she's a five-time winner in a mile. Let's go back down to Mig. Yeah, guys, not much of my opinion has changed from what I saw in the paddock, and I continue to like the four, Bonadou. Uh, I just think she gets loose on the lead here. She looks terrific. Um, you know, for a horse that's been in good form, I'm not seeing any regression. She's carrying good weight. Her coat's good. And just getting back to Louis Rivera, I mean, you know, listen, he lost the bug. Years ago, it was really difficult when you lost the bug, particularly if you're riding for stables like Tresvant Stable, you know, people that believed in the weight off, because as soon as you lost that weight allowance, they were looking for other riders. I went from winning 298 races the year I had the bug to 107 then to my worst year then I was healthy throughout the year and I think I won 60 something races before starting to rebuild hopefully Louis Rivera won't go through the, that much of a post apprentice uh, growing pains if you will but I, I like what I've seen from him he's a very polished finisher and uh, it's so important just to get off winning and keep your business going forward. Yeah, Mick, thanks. It's, it's Carlos, tough adjustment, obviously, for any rider when they lose that bug. As, as a trainer, what is, you know, a, a rider who's lost that bug, what do they got to show you before you start saying, this is someone I want to start using on my horses? Well, the main thing, I think, is the work ethic. The work ethic is very important. If they're out there at 5.30 in the morning, and you know how the winters could be, could be a little bit difficult conditions, and they really have that passion and drive, it's hard to get some of the big owners, especially after they lose their bug. Everybody has a wait-and-see approach. But, uh, you know, you have to have faith. I think it's also hard for them from a confidence level because they're, as you're talking about, they're going to lose some of that good business they're getting because people want to use them because they're getting the weight off. So they just naturally, I don't care how good their agent is, they're not going to get as good mounts. And I can imagine for a rider, you're going to start, it's hard because, so you end up not doing as well. You're not necessarily not doing as well because you're a bad rider. You're the exact yeah. same rider. Yep. It might not even be the weight. It's just that you're not getting on the horse flesh. So I imagine that can have a ripple effect. And it's tough, you know, to get to prove to people, hey, you got to still use me. And I look back to when Kira McLaughlin had the um, confidence to leave IRAD on questing up in Saratoga after he lost the bug in both first the CCA Oaks and then the Alabama. And that was a huge conversation lost the bug. Why is he leading him on? And those big wins. Right. And I think that really helped Irad. He probably would have been fine anyway. <laughs> but I think it helped make that adjustment. And Kieran having that confidence in him. And I think a lot of people might forget that I think that was a very important thing for Irad. Irad still Irad talks about forgot. it. That was a yeah. big moment in his career. But Kieran was, a, I think, saw what probably some others a little earlier than most of us, how good Irad was going to be. Well, I think his other grade one win besides questing was Poseidon's Adventure. Uh, Poseidon, wow. Poseidon's, not Adventure, what's his name? Warrior. 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 When he won the Vanderbilt, like $50, I think, up in Saratoga. Late pick four starts here. There's a 6-5 to five favorite with Manny Franco, Midtown Lights, stepping in. Let's go upstairs. Chris Griffin, the call. Clover Street. All set. And they're off. Very slow start there for Eros's girl is at the back of the field. In between horses, Bonadou has got early speed. It's Bonadou right out towards the front, and April Antics is trying to move up to catch this leader early. Midtown Lights is towards the far outside, and down towards the inside, that's Freddie Moe Factor, makes it four across the racetrack. Clover Street's going to track in fifth, and behind that comes Carbon. Just got passed by My First Love in the green cap towards the back end of the field. The two trailers, Amity Island and Eros's girl. Bonadou has got the lead. It's Bonadou went 24 seconds flat for the opening quarter mile. 
April Antics. Now applies the pressure right towards the outside. No easy leads as Bonadu and April Antics, they go at it. They're within a half length of one another. Here comes Freddie Mo Factor is alone in third. Clover Street towards the outside. Shoved along here is Midtown Lights and losing some ground. To the inside of that one is My First Love, less than a half mile to go. Also trying to rally on is Carbon from the back end, Eros' girl and Amity Island. It's still Bonadu in front and 48 seconds flat for that half mile time. Bonadu and April Antics, Clover Street. Trev McCarthy, they're on the move. Three wide coming after the leaders, just stalking that early pace. And here comes Clover Street right after the leaders. My First Love is trying to follow that move as well. Carbon's trying to launch a rally from the back with Freddie Mo Factor. They reach the top of the stretch. Bonadu has now shaken loose here. It's Bonadu who's up by two. Three widening lengths here. Bonadu just keeps on striding away. Still chasing on the outside, it's April Antics. Up on the far outside is Clover Street. Down to the inside here is Carbon. But Bonadu has a 16th left to go. And Bonadu is still doing it very nicely up top. It's all Bonadu. Bonadu is your winner. Bonadu wins it. Clover Street will get second over April Antics and Carbon. In one minute, 41 and one. Speed prevails here in the fifth at Aqueduct. Bon Adieu, three wins in a row, all of them gate to wire. She's in great form. I, I couldn't have had this race any more incorrect. I didn't like her. The favorite did absolutely no running at any point. An easy win, and nice to see Lou Rivera, I guess, his first win in a non-apprentice. Excellent, excellent. Tries hard every race, gives it his best. I'm happy also for Maggie Seidman. Her birthday, a longtime breeder in New York, does an excellent job, has a passion for the game, and does a lot for aftercare. So Maggie's Philly ran a really good second. Clover Street for Sideman Stable. Have a great birthday, Maggie Sideman. Oh, she's great. She's on Twitter. She's great. Yeah. Very familiar with Maggie. I believe she went to Skidmore. You're exactly right. Going to Skidmore, yes. yeah. Four, nine, five, six, a 41 to one shot. Sneaking into the top four here, but it was no doubt about your winner. Two to one. Bon Adieu leads every step of the way. Once establishing that front end, five-year-old Mare on a roll right now. Three consecutive victories for the Rudy Rodriguez barn. Luis Rivera Jr. Stay on. That's all he had to do here. <laughs> yeah, she was she was much the best. And I mean, the favorite, um, the Midtown Lights, she never did any running at all. She wasn't even remotely forward. She no. was like fifth or sixth early. And you could tell a quarter mile in the race that she wasn't going to be a factor. Prices when we come back. We'll look ahead to next week's Triple Crown Trail that goes through Hot Springs. Grade one champagne winner from here in New York, Timberlake. Set for his three-year-old debut for Brad Cox. We'll tell you how he's doing ahead of his Derby Prep Showdown. for the finish, and it is Silver State. One forty, one forty, one forty, one hundred forty miles on. Grade one winner, Silver State, standing at Claiborne Farm. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the sport of kings, no matter where you are, with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Breeders' Cup champion, Good Magic, by Sire of Sires, Curlin, was the sire of first crop Kentucky Derby champion, Mage, one of three grade one winners to date, along with Muth and Blazing Sevens. In 2023, with just two crops to race, Good Magic ranked 21st on the general sire list with nine and a half million in earnings. Two-year-old sold for up to $2 million, and yearling sold for up to $725,000. Good Magic, the classic sire.
You're watching America's Day of the Races on FS2. It's brought to you in part by legendary Claiborne Farm. 100 years of doing the usual unusually well. Late pick four here in New York begins with this gate to wire winner. Bon adieu, third win in a row. And a very happy Luis Rivera Jr. just recently, as we mentioned, lost that bug and easy win here. And I guess the other thing to say is it's important for any jockey, but if you're in this situation, this transition, when you ride horses that are two to one, it's really important to do well with them. You know, you, you've got to be showing, I'm winning on the horses that, I mean, he wasn't favored, she wasn't, he wasn't favored actually, but regardless, I'm winning on the horses that are supposed to do well, because if you don't, the, Carlos, I imagine a lot of trainers don't have a lot of patience for riders that aren't. A lot of, well. a lot of trainers and a lot of owners, it's a thin, uh, Rope here in New York. You're only as good as your last race, unfortunately. A lot of good riders here. Six dollars fifty cents for the win. Rudy Rodriguez owns part of this five-year-old mare as well, along with Warner Stable, Clover Street, April Annex, Carbon. Round out that top four. As we move on to race six, sixteen thousand dollar claiming sprint at six furlongs, and a lot of horses who used to be very good. Not quite the same anymore. I thought the most incredible thing about this race was that it held together as well as it did. You knew that one of the three entry had to scratch because Romero Mirage was named on both and it didn't seem like Rob Atras would run two speed horses, or Rudy Rodriguez, excuse me, in the one entry. Everybody else stayed in. It's an interesting race. Yeah, I know there's a lot going on in this race. Horses from Finger Lakes, horses that have back class dropping down. Jacobs could be streaky. Paul Barrow, I've had a lot of luck with busting stones. I kind of like that horse a little bit today, getting the right trip with breaking stones. $1.25 million on the line. Meanwhile, next weekend, we're going to have live coverage on the road to the Kentucky Derby that goes through Hot Springs, Arkansas with the Rebel. Mile and a 16th, 13. Line up for this race. The ABR race of the week, and the big name seems like a standout in here. Grade one champagne winner, Timberlake, coming back for Brad Cox. You don't know about horses off layoffs. I don't know if ultimately he's going to be a mile and a quarter horse, but I have very little doubt that from a talent standpoint, he is one of the absolute most talented three-year-olds in the country. Yeah, he was awesome last year. He really showed it against the top horses. He showed up when he had to, and he was really impressive in some events. The distance is probably the biggest question going forward, though, no doubt. You know, you watch, this is his champagne, where he ran extremely well to win. I had kind of misunderstood his Breeders' Cup, to be honest, and watched it again last night. He actually ran very, very well in there. He was wide without cover basically the entire way around the track and ran a respectable race finishing fifth where I think he earned pretty much the same figure he got in the Champagne. If he shows up in that race, somebody better make a step forward in there to be able to beat him because Even to me, just what he's with no improvement right, right, probably. Right, exactly. Yeah. Brad Cox calls him a big league horse. The way he's working, he's provided a bullet work fairgrounds, quickest of 46 that morning. It's obviously training in the right way coming up to his three-year-old debut. I, I almost feel like when I looked at the race, Carlos, yesterday, I had forgotten how good he was. Yeah, no, uh, Brad Cox has got a, a, a bunch of great horses in his barn, and this horse may be, turn out to be the best. 50 points on the line to the winner to get to that starting gate from that Oaklawn Road to the Derby, then the 100-point Arkansas Derby later in March. But next weekend, going to be a lot of fun with that Rebel coming up, and of course, earlier on, that coverage from Saudi. Yeah, that and the, and the Saudi Cup is coming out an absolute war. I mean, that, I think that's going to be the best running they've had of that race so far. Dutro seems like uh, his horse is on all cylinders. What a burial! Uh, it'd be be he, great to he better be. be some comeback. Going to be quite a duel taking on yeah Pegasus winner, National Treasure, Breeders' Cup runner-up, Dermaso Tagake, uh, among others. We're going to take a timeout when we return. Actually, got his first ever win not that long ago, April 2019 for Christian Torres. Now he's a mainstay at the top of the Oakland Park jockey standings. More on his story when we come back on our FS2 coverage.
back with you on America's Day at the Races. Look at Cedar Run Farms, 200 acre layup and foaling facility just west of Hot Springs, owned by Randy Patterson. Campaigned grade one winner Moonshine Mullen, who's become one of the building blocks of what they do, targeting Arkansas bread program out there at Oakland Park. Our live coverage continues with the fifth at Oaklawn ahead. We just saw Money Run dominant back in race four, this fifth race, six furlongs, $16,000 climbing race that kicks off the late take five sequence. Let's go to Paul for more. Yeah, a little tough little race here because it's really, I thought it was difficult to figure out the pace in here. Like you could argue that the three in here for Nikki Juarez and uh, Danny Ward is a horse that's going to go to the front end in here, has shown some really good speed. But then I focus on this horse on the screen, the one as we go through the post parade, Diva Triva. I, I don't think this mare has a big shot, but, you know, this horse has gone 21 and change, and now is getting the bug boy, Carlos Barbosa, aboard. So I would think the one's going to blast out of there and could at least affect the first quarter mile of this race. Scott Becker brings in the two. Um, from St. Louis. Here's the four, La Vie. Look, the four and the eight were a tiny bit uh, washy on the racetrack. I think the eight got hosed down a little bit where the four has gotten a little bit more worked up. Sometimes you got to pay attention to that. You can see it, a horse looks like maybe on their front end that they're a little bit washy, but sometimes they get hosed down. The six is the horse that I like here. I don't know if five to two is the right price, but this is the Diodoro sort of drop down. There's some speed in this race. Christian Torres looking for a natural hat trick, his third in a row. And I just think Triple L's cutter gets some pace to run into. The eight near X, excuse me, HT Zena for here from Matt Scherer is very, very consistent and she cuts back in distance as well. So the six and the eight are the two horses that are going to be coming from off the pace. Then the outside mayor, essential business. Greg Compton won a race earlier today. You know, he claimed this horse off Doug O'Neill. And last race, this horse was the favorite and got dead left. It was a weird beginning, just really broke awkward. It was never part of the race, but actually kind of ran on okay and showed a little bit of interest. And it's taken a little money today with Harry Hernandez aboard. Um, and they don't go, they go up in class actually to 16,000, but the 10's taken a little bit of money. And to be honest with you, I thought that horse looked probably the best on the racetrack, but I'm going to stick with the six here in the drop down with Diodoro from off the pace here at five to two. Paulie, thanks. Yeah, that 10 horse essential business. So claimed off of Doug O'Neill. Didn't get out of the gate well last time out. If this horse actually can break, she might be the quickest in the field. It felt like it, like, like she didn't handle the track at all last time. Now, listen, she was a big drop down for, for, for Doug, and he was begging somebody to claim, claim her, but I think she's dangerous here. She looked great on the track, too. She really warmed up excellent. She was a little keen, but she settled right down, and she can't look any better from a physical standpoint. You put a line through that race. I mean, she's got figures that... Some of these others can't touch. Well, she just, I mean, as you said, she got left in there. And just you could just see right away she was not happy out there. She made up a little ground at the end. And, ah, listen, she's, I don't, I wouldn't, she's impossible to completely trust in here. But I, I think she is the interesting horse. I mean, nothing against the, the six who's dropping down and, and cutting back in distance. I looked up some numbers uh, for Robertino Diodoro. Overall, he's 24% with a lot of starters going from routes to sprints in the dirt. At Oakland, he's 15 for 62 over the last five years with a $2 and one set ROI. It's a pretty healthy ROI for a guy who runs a lot of horses at short prices. And then you got the three, and Carlos Pauly was talking about this one with some speed, was a winner, um, three-time winner actually on this track, but one here at Oakland at the meet back on December 15th. Yeah, Dan Ward, uh, former assistant to uh, Hollendoffer, Jerry Hollendoffer, Hall of Fame trainer, trying to get going. I'm not so sure if I trust the, the three. I thought the other interesting horse was the eight, young trainer, Matt Shear, running with better horses, dropping back, cutting back in distance. I thought she looked also really, really healthy on the track, and she's getting some significant late money here at 7-2. to two. I think the eight uh, offers a, a big win candidate here today. You, you mentioned Dan Ward, who was the assistant for, for Jerry Hollendorfer. I mean, he went out on his own. Uh, he's not exactly, he's more like us. He's not that young a man. It's unusual yeah. to see a trainer who been assistant for a long time going out on his own. And I know he's had some success. Yeah, no, it's, it's not easy. Definitely in any age to go out on your own, especially in this business, it's tough. Although for you, you had... Instant six. You were youngest trainer ever to win a grade one, weren't you? Yeah, I was very fortunate. Is that we, true? Yeah, we claimed a really great filly by a firm called By the Firm, and 
I have to admit I had some help uh, having a three-time champion uh, Clips Award trainer like my father by my side, but she just turned out to be an amazing story. Being by affirmed, Howie, the great Howie Tesher and uh, Butch Lanzini, at that time Steinbrenner, the owner, the Yankee owner, changed uh, trainers like he changed managers. So we just kind of got lucky. And they had been running her in sprint races and being by affirmed, we stretched her out and then she wound up winning the grade one top flight with Julie Crone and Morbin Studd, who owned a great horse uh, unaccounted for, wound up buying her for a lot of money. We won a grade one for them. So it was a, it was a magical time, definitely. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I forgot that Butch Lenzini trained for Steinbrenner. I know how he did. Hard to believe that how he got fired. <laughs> would he great men. Would the boss come back around like he did with Billy Martin as a manager? Probably. Fire you, rehire I you? I mean, everybody. I mean, Nick Zito <laughs> trained for yeah, him. Nick had some success, too. Yeah. I know we went well, to Bellamy the Road. Yeah, Bellamy Diligence, Road the wood, right? Diligence as well. It was a very good horse. We went to the Eclipse Awards for the champion Florida bred at the Steinbrenner Inn in Ocala, and I can say he did, didn't want to come up for the uh, owner's trophy of the brooder of the year for by the firm for horse of the year, but I was happy to get the trophy for the trainer. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, Steinbrenner, obviously. Well, he 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 owned, was it this Tampa or Thistledown? I thought he had something to do with Tampa in the he, beginning. He, owned, he had to divest himself. Major League oh. Baseball made him sell. They wouldn't allow an owner to also own a racetrack oh. at the time, and it was Tampa, and he was, a, I don't know if he was complete owner or part owner, yeah. and he had to divest himself. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. Times have changed. Times have changed. Now you can legally bet on sports. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite here, the six. <laughs> Triple L's cutter. Coming out of an entry level allowance where she did not make really any impact. And now is going to get easier company. We'll see what happens. You're a little interested in the eight, Carlos. I'm a little interested in the ten. But I'm just waiting for Greg to give out the good steam because he's. <laughs> we had a little fun at Oakland. We had a yesterday. good day yesterday. Yes, we did. Late we in the card. Fun. Yep. Fifth at Oakland. This starts the late pick five once again. Matt Dinnerman, the call. She Dazzle has got it. La Vie post four. Two back. Alsana in essential business of the pick. Alsana goes in. Now essential business. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, uneventful start. Diva Trevor from the inside, offensive-minded. Strides clear in the early stages. About two ahead of She Dazzle, who runs in second with Simona's Choice off the pace today. Catch us if you can inside of her. A length and a half to La V. Essential Business is next. And then comes Halaga, running alongside of Essential Business. That pairs six lengths off the loose leader, Diva Treva. Then comes HT Zena, running in the third last spot. Triple L's cutter at the back with Alsana into the far turn. The field separated by 13 or 14 lengths. Diva Treva at 17 to 1 strings them out. Diva Treva steps on the gas, opens up three around the far turn, says, Come and catch me if you can. Catch us if you can. And second, with She Dazzle sent along from that position. And they're well clear of the others as they come off the turn. Diva Treva and apprentice Carlos Barboza drift a little wide off the turn. They're still in control of the race by four. Catch us if you can all out. She Dazzle alongside of her battling in second with a 16th to go. Diva Treva still clear by four. She Dazzle, HT Zena coming on late. Diva Treva needs the line. She's almost there. HT Zena lunging and she's going to get her. HT Zena and Francisco Arietta nailed Diva Treva on the line. In third was essential business and then there was a photo finish for fourth. 17 to one long shot. Desperate for that wire. Andy Serling told Carlos and I. She's on fumes, and she was. H.T. Zena, Francisco Arietta, the eight. Nice call, Carlos, comes and gets her. Yeah, I, I feel for anybody but the one, and she was a big drop down. It feel like somebody had a, a little bit of a put over in mind with her, and she looked home, but you could just see, you could just feel them sort of coming together, and your horse, Carlos, on the cutback, making a big run. The number eight, H.T. Zena, gets the job done. My 10 horse did a little running at the end as well, but... If you bet the one Diva Treva, you got our sympathy here because you looked home. Had a huge number. 8 1 10 2 HT Zena with the victory. We're going to take a timeout when we return Dylan Davis off to a tremendous start in 2024, leading the way at this Aqueduct winter meeting. 27 victories, 
are already over $1.4 million in earnings. We'll be back. Right there, a million two hundred thousand. Eighty million twenty-five million five hundred fifty. Mitchell five hundred fifty thousand. And now five hundred. And a million five hundred thousand. Thank you. Eighty million four hundred fifty. Eighty million seventy-five. Four hundred seventy-five thousand. Eighty million seventy-five thousand. Eighty million seventy-five thousand. Eighty million Tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit BelmontStakes.com slash tickets today. Racelands is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. Racelands, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. Good to have you with us on our President's Day coverage. America's Day at the Races on FS2. More coming up from Aqueduct and Oaklawn. Sixth next in New York. $16,000 claiming six furlong sprint. The sun's out and that snow's melting away. And there is a look at the six. Huge long shot here for Urban's Hope. Right now the 2-2-B two, two favored entry as we approach the five minute mark to post. I'm a little interested in the three X bourbon, bre breaking stones, excuse me. It's funny to look at him and you just assume he's gonna be a, a, a bust in stones and he of course was bred by Roddy Valenti as well. That's but right. um, his last race was okay. It was a much tougher field. He was wide, the rail was good. He chased the horse, finished second, it was on the rail. I, I thought he was a little interesting in this race, but this is a tough race. Yeah, I liked him as well. I think Paul Barrow, like I was explaining, He's an old school trainer. Year in and year out, he gets a lot of his horses, gets the most out of them. And this horse is kind of more of the consistent, albeit he was running at Finger Lakes numbers, but I think he's a horse that looks like he's got the consistency. Uh, a lot of these other horses up and down, drop downs. I kind of thought he was interesting at the price as well. There's the Barrow horse, the remaining half of that entry, the 3X breaking stones. Going to break middle of the pack in here. Meanwhile, this is Commerce Comet. Four horse going to have post two for Chris Engelhart and gets Manny Franco. Um, one of the reasons I brought this replay up was I couldn't find a single other horse to show a replay for because most horses had been running very well. This is his race two back when he won easily, and I don't think he ran that badly last time. First of all, it's a better field, but also that was a day where you really had to be saving ground to be effective, and he chased two, three wide around the track while Ryan's cat was able to wire the field, and I don't think he's the speed in here, but I expect him to be forward with the one Chateau obviously going. He's pretty fast horse, and Chris Engelhardt has been on a good run. I thought he made a decent amount of success, sense in here. Five to one right now. Yeah, it's a sneaky, sneaky good race that next start. You see fourth beat seven plus lengths, but again, it was against much tougher. A little bit wide that day. I'm not sure a similar effort couldn't win this race, to be honest. And I know he lost by a bunch, but the track has been very fair. Um, the last couple of days, I've found it to be perfectly fair. We're seeing some closers do well. We're seeing, so I think the track has got sorted itself out a little bit because the weather and winter can be hard for the yeah, race no, track. Definitely the conditions can be difficult. We were, were able to come from off the pace and get up similar to the race we just saw at Oakland with True Empress. So I think you're right. The track has been playing fair. Post right here coming up for this 
sixth here in New York as we take a look at Chateau, who is, Andy mentioned, very quick and gets the rail here. He's one of the quickest horses on the grounds. He's a lower-level claimer at this point, but he is fast. Clem Labine, post three, drop down in class for this David Jacobson runner. I'm going to assume this is, I mean, you never know with Jacobson, but this appears to be the one they're betting. I don't love him, but he is making considerable drop in class. Well, the other half of, of the entry, the 2B here, way back April of last year, some big races on the West Coast. Oh, he's got races that would make him very tough in here, but, I mean, he's dropping too, but his last two have been disasters. Remaining half of the entry for the 3-3X, three and three X, breaking stones. Thought he was a bit against it last time. He's got some good races. He's my pick. Just talking about Commerce Comet, winner two back. I think he's a very, very logical horse that should be forward here. This is the favorite, Cajun Casanova, first off the claim, Rob Atris. I don't love when horse gets claimed for 25000 and comes right back for 16000 They'll make money if he wins and gets claimed, but that's a big risk. But he is a logical horse dropping out of a tougher spot. Biggest price on the board, Bourbon's Hope. I just, I can't really make a case for him. I guess he has some back races that give him a, a sniff. Nobody rides for free. Big number as well. Rafael Hernandez. Tough to claim the bottom level and move them up. But I will say, Leah Shimongal is a trainer to notice with big price yeah, horses. Yeah, I agree. And mm -hmm. Ryder, we told you about coming here from Woodbine, former champion up north of the border. One more brew, 12-1. to 1. If somebody wins the big price near, I thought he was the most likely candidate. His last two haven't been good. But you could make small excuses, sloppy seal tracks, and his other two dirt races are good. And Mr. Phil he used to be a really good sprinter and graded stakes company. Obviously not that same horse anymore as a seven-year-old. I agree. He claimed out of his last race. The thing about him is even when he was at his best, he really needed the lead to win. And unless Chateau fails to get out of the gate, he ain't getting the lead from that guy. Eight to one from that outside post. Let's go downstairs to Mig. Guys, I'm, I'm going to just talk about horses from a physical perspective, and I'm going to kind of throw the form out a little bit. Um, the horses that stood out in the paddock, starting with the four, Commerce Comet, a uh, horse that's run extremely well for Manny Franco. Uh, the, he, he looks terrific. I mean, he's coat, he's carrying great weight. Um, I, I, I think he's a major uh, player here. The nine horse on the out, towards the outside, Mr. Phil, uh, another one, just making a really nice impression. Love the weight he's carrying, love his coat. Think he's well drawn outside, and he probably gets a stalking trip. And a horse that it was a standout physically uh, and lower profile connections. They don't win at a high percentage. The six bourbons hope getting class relief. This horse is outstanding physically. I, I, I mean, he was head and shoulders above anybody else. Now, he doesn't exactly hit my profile where I, his recent form matches up with what I'm seeing physically. But in a race that I think something crazy could happen, I'm picking number six, Bourbon Soap. Eduardo Jones' horses look good. If he runs to his looks, he should outrun his odds. I'll take a swing at 27-1. to Wow, biggest price on the board. That's going to be Mig's selection. I'm, I agree with him, too, on the ninth. I thought Mr. Phil looked outstanding warming up uh, from that outside post. I'm not knocking somebody picks a big price. I didn't see it, but who knows? 30 to 1 on Mig's selection. Now, that's your favorite, the five. Cajun Casanova. Rob Atris. Back to what Rob Atris is usually like in the winter at Aqueduct. Thirty percent at the meet right now. Yeah, thirty-two percent. He's rolling, and he's you know it's a, it's one of those moves like Andy says. You don't love to see a horse drop off the claim, but he's winning. The purses in New York are almost thirty-nine thousand dollars. It's probably the right move at the right time to keep the momentum going for the barn. Chris Griffin, the call. Here's the six from Aqueduct. And they're off. Speed to the inside from Chateau, right out towards the front and there. Chateau with that early kick, also trying to join this leader. Here comes Sunrise Journey, is now tracking from second at the rail. That's Commerce Comet in third. Out wider, progressing as Breaking Stones is in the fourth position. The rest are very far out there. One more brew. Mr. Phil, nowhere to go. About eight wide here as they work up the back stretch. Also in that grouping comes Bourbon's Hope. It's another big gap here. Call it about another five. Back to Cajun Casanova. Just got passed by Nobody Rides for Free, and the early trailer is Clem Labine. It's Chateau who's trying to get away from a 22 and 4 for the opening quarter mile. Chateau's got the lead. Sunrise Journey is right here from second. At the rail, there's Commerce Comet trying to make up some late ground as well. Very strung out here as they reach the top of the stretch, and Chateau is still doing it nicely at 5-1. to one. It's Chateau who kicks on, is up by a quick two, three lengths now. Sunrise Journey up on the outside. Also, Commerce Comet is in the clear and chasing this leader, but Chateau continues to keep going up front. It is Chateau now 
four in front as they approach the final 16th. Chateau with a very nice, impressive effort here. It is all Chateau, no doubt. Chateau wins it. Then came Commerce Comet, late rally here. That was Bourbon's Hope is in a photo with Clem Labine. A woman at 12.57 seconds. Five to one, Chateau Ruben Silvera for trainer Rudy Rodriguez. Speed is deadly. Uh, he's a horse that was very hard to trust. Um, he had run at this level two back and had fallen apart late. And one thing about Chateau, Carlos, he's one of those horses and he got it done today. I remember joking this about to Rob Atris a couple years ago. I said, he's the kind of horse, you're never home. I mean, I've seen him two in front of the 16th pole get gobbled up. He, uh, but he is quick. Credit to Rudy. I mean, such a great old class horse. Everybody probably, including myself, wrote him off today thinking he's seen better days, but he showed up today with a big effort. Yeah, this was, this was the old man special here. Nine year old, had some old veterans in this group that had really done some, some good things in the past. Not the same as they were, but this is an old throwback effort to Chateau and some of the other horses too, Andy not running their best races. They just didn't show up. I mean, a lot of horses didn't show up. The two, I think, was running at the end, finished fourth or fifth, but, um, you know, that horse got completely left and was the live half, theoretically live half of the Jacobson entry. My horse, I mean, the horse Carlos and I liked had a good trip. He no was in a good spot. He just went the wrong way. I mean, the horse Richie mentioned actually ran fine, at least, you know, picking up the pieces for third, but certainly outran his odds. He's really the only horse that did anything sort of surprising outside of the winter. winter. One, four, six, two, five to one on your winner. Carlos, thanks for joining us. We had a good time. Great, great afternoon, President's Day. We're getting closer to some exciting races coming up. Thank you for having me again. Good to see you. Yeah, warmer always, sure. weather and yeah, bigger races on the horizon, especially in that three-year-old division. So we will see you soon. We're going to take a timeout. We'll be back. More to come. Main events here at Aqueduct and at Oak Lawn on the way with Chateau at five to one. Showing up with that speed once again to pick up the ninth win in this nine-year-old's career. Back with you on America's Day of the Races on our FS2 coverage. Hope you're enjoying President's Day. Hopefully with a day off. Spending time with some family. Day, a day with you is a, it's like a day off. Yeah, I enjoy it. Spend a day with you. Chateau at 5-1 to one throwback performance. Yeah. He wasn't stopping here. They weren't coming close to him. And uh, 
They serve a, a bit of a merry-go-round race where there really was very little movement. The only horse that made any kind of movement at all was the long shot that Richie mentioned, the six, who, who sort of snuck up the rail and narrowly got third. At least that did a little running. Nobody else, really. So Ruben Silvera, Rudy Rodriguez, owns part of this nine-year-old as well, along with Kevin Turkelson. Nine career wins versus one coming into this race. Had won over seven hundred forty thousand dollars in his career. I uh, one time he was, you know, he was running in some better, much better races, and he's a rocket ship. All right, let's head back to Oaklawn. Late pick four begins in this race. It's a maiden special weight, six furlong sprint, and Simovich the sixth put together two really good efforts, but has not gotten the money. Two runner-ups will today be the day. Third off a long layoff. It's a good question. You got a first-time starter taking some money too. The eight true faith who's a half too croupy who won yeah. a discovery recently. Rudolph for set runner. Ricardo Santana Jr. there. We're gonna take a timeout. We return first full season in Hot Springs for this two-time Eclipse Award winner as an apprentice and as a journeyman, Julian Le Peru having a nice meet already over $1.4 million in earnings. Quality Road, proving lanes ends, tried and true, stallion making tradition. Quality Road has sired multiple Eclipse Award and grade one winners, including champion two-year-old Colt Corniche, champion two-year-old filly Caledonia Road, champion three-year-old filly Abel Tasman, grade one winner Bleecker Street, and classic winner National Treasure. He's a leader of his generation. Quality Road, a stallion that stands above the rest. It's America's original sport, and no one covers it better than America's Best Racing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle, the best races, horses, and destination venues, cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more. America's Best Racing.net is a sport for you. War Dancer, New York's leading turf sire again in 2023 with standouts like Barrage at Saratoga. Here's Barrage with a final surge. Barrage got him. War Saichi dominant on the dirt at Finger Lakes. War Saichi has scampered well clear. War Saichi all the way with the top spot. And Danzig Queen on the tap of the surface at Woodbine. And Danzig Queen will come away and win by a length. Consistently producing winners on dirt, turf, and synthetic. War Dancer, proud to stand in New York. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on every screen, every, screen every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. French jockey Julian Leperu has had an esteemed career since moving to the U.S. nearly 20 years ago and kicking things off as a champion apprentice jockey. He followed that up by winning the Eclipse Award for Outstanding Jockey in 2009, the same year he won three Breeders' Cup races. Informed decision two for Julian Leperu. They won the Breeders' Cup filly and mare sprint. In 2015, he won his sixth career Breeders' Cup race aboard a filly he considers the best he's ever ridden. Two-time champion and Hall of Famer, Teppin. Look at Teppin! Teppin! Oh, she was huge today! Both fillies runs on late for a second, but Teppin and Julia LaPeru have dominated the Breeders' Cup mile. Teppin was always my, my favorite. She, she was so amazing. Here comes Teppin, and Teppin and Julia LaPeru have won! You know, I think the Royal Ascot win was such a, a special thing. People were surprised about it, but us. It was something um, very special, yeah. Now at age 40, Le Peru is hoping to rejuvenate his career. He's hired a new agent in Jose Santos Jr., and the pair decided it best for Le Peru and his family to spend the winter in Hot Springs for the first time. I got together with Jose, a new agent. When we first got together, we didn't have any plans for the winter. 
left it to him to decide where we're gonna go. Yeah, very excited to, to be here. Be around horses, around the fans. It's always a fun time. Being in the morning, see trainers, seeing, seeing owners. It's a whole business that uh, we love, you know. And be around here is, uh, you know, it's a. It was a dream when I was five years old. So to be able to do it as a job is, uh, it's great. Le Peru feels right at home back at Oaklawn Park, the site of one of his biggest victories. It was seven years ago he guided reigning two-year-old champion Classic Empire to a late surging victory in the Arkansas Derby. Here comes Classic Empire trying to run down the new leader, Malagasy, the champ, Classic Empire. It is Conquest Money, Classic Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him back to the winner's circle. The winner of the 81st running of the Arkansas Derby, Classic Empire and jockey Julian Leperu. Leperu is embracing his role as the accomplished veteran in a room full of mostly younger riders and says there's one thing that gives him a leg up on the competition. I think experience, you know, you, with age you, you get experience. Black log, a nice effort. Look, he's been working hard and he's got fantastic touch on a horse. I could give you a list of graded stake horses he's won on for me going back um, years and years. So always great working with him. Riding more and more every day, you, you learn something every day in this business. After a race when you know you've done everything perfectly, everything went great, it's uh, always a, a, a nice thing, you know. So again, first full season in Hot Springs for Julian Lepreau. And back, you know, when he won the Apprentice Eclipse Award, he became the first Apprentice ever to lead the nation in wins. He had over 400 wins that year. Wow. And in earnings, he had 12.4 million in earnings. Over 400 wins? Yes. Wow. It's impressive. I remember when he first burst the scene. Big fan of Julian's. I like Julian a lot. I know. I think he takes a lot of unfair grief, actually. He's a little patient at times, but he's a terrific rider, and I'm glad to see him doing well down at Oakland. Oh, he's going to ride for Kenny McPeak in the Rebel next week at Oakland on the road to the Kentucky Derby and nurse this horse along on the front end to a victory last time out gate to wire. Yeah, he's going to have to run a lot better than he ran this race to get the job done here. He's winning in his, in his seventh start and got a 79 buyer. Now, the reality of the race is once you sort of get past the favorite here, Timberlake and Just Steel, and I think Just Steel ran very, very well in the Southwest. You know, Luke, he's not missing any dances. Um, there's a lot of room for horses. So I guess he could be in the conversation, but... I don't know. He's five to one morning line. I wouldn't bet a nickel on him at five to one. I bet Timberlake is six to five before I bet him. Well, he's going to be the horse to beat. Race goes through him. That great one winner, of course, of the champagne. Timberlake for Brad Cox as we get back to the sixth. And Le Peru, we'll see in this race coming up as well on Pineland for Lindsey Schultz, short leaf stable. The horse who the first two starts of his career. Late last year, Churchill Downs put in some good efforts. We'll see if he can break through in his four-year-old comeback. Now let's go to Paul for more. Yeah, I thought this was a very difficult race to start off your late pick four, and I'm kind of with you. I do like Pineland a tiny bit in his four-year-old debut, getting blinkers. And, you know, in his first career start, he did show tremendous speed for Lindsay Schultz, and she's tremendous, 33% from 61 to 180 days. We're going to go through the post parade for you. Don Corleone. We'll go through right after the two in here for Ramon Vasquez and Peter Miller. We've been seeing Kaleem Shaw and Gary Barber, um, horse owners for Peter Miller, been shipping a lot of horses here. This one, a little bit of an overlay, musical maestro for the Asmussen crew here. <sighs> Has to improve, although, you know, lightly raced, so it could be a horse that does have improvement in him. Miracle Workers got the best two numbers, but the Brad Cox barn has been a little bit chilly of late, and that's 17%. You know, Andy was talking about the Diodoro barn being chilly at 17%. I guess you could say the Cox barn is chilly. Simovich just missed last time. That was a tough beat. You know, was able to kind of lay off slow fractions. So I really don't know what to do with Simovich at nine to five. I think kind of a play against just because of that. The eight in here for Rudy Brissett is getting bet. 12 to one on the morning line. Got bullet drills all over the place at Windstar where Rudy prepares a lot of his horses. They paid 575,000 for this son of Candy Ride. The eight here, true faith here for Windstar and Sienna. 
in the horse's life as can be on the board. Looked tremendous on the racetrack. And I think this is a first time a race that a first time starter really can win. I do like Pineland a little bit, but the way they're playing the eight and the way the eight looked on the racetrack, I had this race two, eight, eight, two. I'm going to disagree a little with Paulie here. I think whoever made the 8-12 to 1 morning line made a horrifically bad line. We, we don't pay attention to these lines I mean, at Oakland. Right, this is a $575,000 purchase for Windstar. You know, uh, Brett at Claiborne coming for Rudy Brissett. I'm not even sure he's that live at 9-2, to two, to be honest. I mean, you know, I, I respect Paulie's opinion a great, great deal, but I just think that's a bad morning line. Paulie's being kind. Yeah, um, I'm not. Paulie's much nicer than I am. <laughs> Not, yeah, look, that pedigree from this barn, yeah. the, the family, as you mentioned, After Dan Produce Croopy, good. was going to take some money in here. It's another foal that was decent. It's a candy. I mean, this is a, yeah, I mean, to, to suggest that this horse, I mean, that shows some good, decent workouts. I, I, I Listen, the five's the horse to beat. I, I looked up some stats. It's not a huge sample size, but 180 to 360 day layoffs. Maidens and dirt sprints. Brad Cox is nine for 28 with a 225 ROI. So they're essentially, you know, five to two shots, but they're winning basically a third of the time. So if he improves off his races as a three year old at all, he's probably going to win here. And look, when he went to the bench, top three finishers in that maiden special all came back to win. Yes, no. I, I agree. I looked them up. I mean, the winner, the winner, I think, was a Rudy Brissett horse, actually. You've got a 97 buyer. He came back with a 90, but that's not that bad. Um, it, this is the worst to beat. I'm not, you know, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know. I, is the two Pineland a little bit interesting coming off the layoff? Because his first two starts, I know one of them was in a maiden claimer, but they were pretty quick. Yeah, Paul and I both thought this horse yeah. was, was intriguing. His first two starts... A little improvement off that, which you can expect. This horse is right in the mix. And there's nothing wrong with the six. I mean, the other thing about the six is it's not like he was disappointing. He wasn't favored in those races, and he was running good figs. I think he's the horse to beat. Yep. Yeah, Third I, off the bench. He's put together back-to-back -to -back probably best figures of anyone in the field. But now four seconds and seven starts, you start to question a little bit, right? I agree. That's a concern. Um but you know the horse he lost to was a, was an eight was a was a nine to five shot for Norm Cassie, Mr. Keating, who had run back to back eighty one buyers. So that number stands up. I thought he ran well in there though because he was on top of the pace and that pace came apart late. I believe that Mr. Keating made a big run to win the race. Um, so I, I don't have a strong opinion here. I guess what I, if I was going to bet this race, I would try to get the two in the number Pineland with the logical horses, the five and six. Um, would I throw in the eight protectively? Maybe, but I don't know. I think the eight is sort of lukewarm bet. I think if you like the eight, you're betting because you like the horse, not because it appears he's taking much money. And listen, by the way, the five and six were guaranteed to take money, so I'm not saying the, the eight is supposed to be super short. Yeah. But he was, he was never going to be 12 to one. Maybe the quickest horse in the field is Don Corleone here, this three. Uh, eight to one right now. Peter Miller runner who is showing very fast early speed out on the West Coast. And then you have Memphis Farrell, the one, 38 to 1. Tons of changes with this horse, who was pretty quick early, too, a couple of starts. It's been off since August of 22. New gelding, getting Lasix, blinkers coming off, fresh as the rail. If, if nothing else, is going to try and probably contest this pace. Yeah, I don't know if he's really fast enough. I guess from the inside, he's supposed to go. I'm not sure those paces were really that fast. I think he was forward because the paces were moderate. Who knows what to expect from him, but he is almost 40 to 1. I don't, you're not saying you expect him to win. You just thought he could be a little more forward in here. Um, what about the 9? Can't the 9 show some speed? I know he's a long shot, but he, he showed a lot of speed last time. He could be forward in here. I don't know how long that'll last, though. Even bigger price, 57 to 1. Yeah. Um, five five right. of the six, look, they deserve to be the price. They're up two to one, maybe a little short on the five. But they can't bet enough on Brad Cox. Yeah. They just it can't. Look, we saw it here with Midtown Lights. I fell for her, and she was awful. But Brad Cox has become one of those trainers that just, you know, it's the curse of success. You do well, and your horses, and, and, and I think it's hard for trainers because their horses will be underlays and they'll underperform. Underlays are going to underperform. And is the trainer doing a bad job? No. Frankly, a lot of times the betters are doing a bad yeah. job. 
you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, I've, I've, you know, you talk about it with jockeys. I've talked about it with Irad Ortiz. He'll say to me, why was I favored on that horse? Because you rode him. He didn't give the horse a bad ride when he lost. <laughs> he, they, they, the public made a bad favorite. It's nature of the game. We see that especially, yeah, when he comes back here. Sometimes ridiculously so. Sixth at Oaklawn. Again, start of this late pick four. Matt Dinnerman the call. That's right. Musical Maestro, post four, True Faith. And to the outside, Mill Creek Road. They backed out Memphis Pharaoh, the son of the Triple Crown winner, American Pharaoh, who of course won the 2015 Arkansas Derby. They're backing away Memphis Pharaoh. Everybody else standing in the gate here. They're loading Mill Creek Road to the outside post. And to the rail, Memphis Pharaoh to reload. Two to one for number five, Miracle Worker. Five to two for the six, Simovich. Memphis Pharaoh. Goes in, then backed away immediately. We start the late pick four here. Memphis Pharaoh loads again. We're ready. And uh, we're off. Don Corleone put into play early. Miracle Workers up there with that group. Musical Maestro between that pair. Don Corleone with a narrow lead. Musical Maestro presses. Miracle Worker eases off the speed, running in the third spot. Pineland is next. The first are True Faith alongside of Simovich, and then comes Mill Creek Road. He's running eight lengths off the lead, well off the rail, two better than Memphis Pharaoh. And Miller's right can see them all with a half mile to go. Don Corleone and Ramon Vasquez charge into the turn, three quarters of a length better than Musical Maestro. Right behind him, second. Pineland, third. Miracle Worker alongside of him. Simovich in the fifth position getting off the fence. He's four behind. True Faith in an all-out drive. Miller's right trying to pass runners from the back of the pack. Takes the sixth position as they come to the top of the lane. Don Corleone cuts the corner. Miracle Worker takes the second spot. Musical Maestro gives way between horses. Miracle Worker asks for his best. Runs past Don Corleone. Simovich on the outside is closing now. Grandstand side, Simovich. Miracle Worker still in front. Don Corleone fighting Simovich with a late surge. Miracle Worker, Simovich. It's a photo finish. Very tight. Simovich on the outside. Miracle Worker inside with Don Corleone third and Pineland fourth. Both going off at two to one. Miracle Worker, the five may have just held off Simovich. Let's take another look. Does look like the right there, Sinovich got a little bob there, but it feels like the, I hate to call photos there because I'm not good at it. So it is very close. It did feel like Miracle Worker got it done. Sinovich just he hesitates a little bit, right? He's got a little bit of anger in him. He put a nose in front at one he, point, he but did. the best of the bob goes to the five. He Was did. it at the right time? We'll find out in a moment here. And listen, we talked about they were the right two favorites, and at the end of the day, they were the right two horses. It's just, you know, sometimes it works out that way. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's hard to read it, but it does feel like the five won, won the race, and the first or the eight. He was sitting fifth early and uh, did not improve his position from there. We did a good job, though, by the way, between the two of us of coming up with the potential tertiary speeds. Memphis Pharaoh and my selection, Mill Creek Road, is potential <laughs> speeds. We didn't like them. They were last and second to last early. <laughs> yeah, not, uh, not what that. we expected there. Yeah. Oof. It's, it's close. Just, it's, it's tough to know. Well, mm. well being told it five, is six. the five. Okay, so Miracle Worker, yeah, got the best of that, Bob, certainly. And nose down in time with the win off the long layoff. Hadn't raced since April 1st of last year for Brad Cox. Comes back as a four year old and gets the victory mm. here. Career start number three with. Axel Concepcion riding for Brad Cox. Last year's Eclipse Award winning apprentice, and Brad's now 10 for 29 off those six to 12 month layoffs and dirt sprints with maidens with an ROI now about $2.34. Back to New York, race seven, seven furlongs. Allowance optional claiming field and the rail to this one right here, Tough Street. 
Chad Brown, five-year-old debut coming up for this mare. It feels like she just needed a little bit of a break after her last race, and she's also not a horse that's at her best in those two-turn mile and eighth races. This race, three back at a mile at Saratoga, she ran second, was a sensational effort by her and probably her career best, because not only did she get a career best by her figure of 89, this was a day, August 30th at Saratoga, where speed was absolutely deadly, and she made a significant run to almost get the money in here. She is a tough horse in here, yet another layer in a race. I mean, you look at this race, right? The favorite's three to one. The longest shot on the board, the seven, is eight to one. I mean, that's a race where the public feels where anyone can win. And, you know, with the exception of that last start, she just shows up just about every single time she runs. She, and she, you know, those were races that just, there just weren't other races for her. But she's not really a two-turn mile and an eighth type horse. These seven furlongs to a mile, one turn elongated sprint races, they fit her like a glove. And, and, and she's dangerous. I, I'm, I picked her third. I'll be honest with you. I think that there are many that can win here. I like Stonewall Star. Um, I think Gimme Kisses who's one of the biggest prices on the board, is very dangerous in here, but I don't think I could put up a big argument against too many horses in here. It looks, you know, looking again, you'd brought up Gimme Kisses. That's the, the six in here. Looks like some serious upside. Lightly race Philly for Todd Pletcher. We'll get back to that one. We start with Bustin Bay gets post two. She's cooled off a little bit, but she's got plenty of good races that give her a chance. Post five for the entry mate, Taming the Tigress. Um, yeah, I mean, she's dangerous as well. She's finally going to get some pace to close into. 4-1, to one, tough street we just showed you in that narrow defeat. Yeah, I, I, I can't argue against anyone that likes her. I think this, this, this seven furlong one-turn race fits her like a glove. You're Stonewall Star. She was against the track last time down in a dead rail for some of the running. It just, it, it, she's a lot better than that. Her race two back and her back form give her a chance. I'm hoping she can lead him on a merry chase. Yeah, she should be forward. Royal Poppy Ray Handle, Dylan Davis. She could be forward as well, and she's far from out of it. Give me kisses. You brought up here for Todd Pletcher, four-year-old debut. She had the run of the race she won, but when she won two back, she beat Security Code, who she's pretty good. And then last time out, that was an impossible spot for her, and she was buried in a pace duel. Yeah, Security Code just won the Broadway the other day. Desert Dalliance, eight to one. She's the longest shot on the board. I thought she'd have to run her very best race to have a chance. And Toehead, Mike Maker. I thought Sarah Obadwe made a good point to me earlier about this horse. The one really good race she ran was the only time she had Lasix. Then she went into stakes. Maybe getting Lasix back could help her out. Won the infamous turf race at Saratoga. That's right, the, the non-race, the turf non-race. Yes. That's right. Jose Lascano will be aboard. Three minutes to post here in the seventh. Let's go downstairs to MIG. Hey, guys, little known fact. I was actually a towhead when I was young. My hair was pretty much white. Let's start down uh, with the one horse, Bustin Bay, who's going to be my top selection. Uh, I think she looks spectacular, and I think she's going to get the right setup. I'm seeing a lot of pace in here. I think she's going to come with her run. She's hard knocking, consistent, 11 time winner. And I just think she's carrying great weight, and I've loved her in the warm up. And she's just moving with such good energy level, great animation to her stride. The two horse, Tough Street. Right, you know, this affiliate kind of lost her form, uh, you know, late last year in, in October. Her last two efforts were poor, but all her other efforts are really good. And she looks ultra sharp. You expect horses to look good coming out of the Chad Brown barn. She is no exception. I like her work tab, too. Just basically throwing those nice 48s every time and 48 and change, 49, making a nice impression. She's only got one start at seven furlongs, and uh, she won off by almost 13 lengths. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And the four Stonewall star is super sharp i mean she could not look any better she looks as fit as can be third start off the layoff she's run against much better she's got speed i was going back and forth i was vacillating between the one bustin bay and the four stonewell star i landed on the one bustin bay because i just think there's a potential for a lot of pace to be on here and maybe bustin bay style will be a little bit more conducive to uh finishing here it, i think it's a really tough heat though well, the good news for Miggy also gets the other half of the entry, who's a major player uh, in this spot, uh, Taming the Tigers. And she's the one, I think, the most that'll benefit from the speed in this race because she's not as forward as the one. And she's also been in races that have not had particularly strong paces. So she does figure to get a good run. Now, listen, I like horse going to be in front, so I'm hoping the pace isn't too hot because I like the number four Stonewall Star who was down towards the inside for some of the running where you didn't want to be last time. And I'm hoping third off a layoff. Ran decent off the layoff. Took a step back, a little against the track. Today, her A effort. And this is a horse that was not bad earlier in her career, running in some pretty tough races. 
Um, so I'm hoping you get a good effort from her. But uh, as Richie said, this is a very, very tough race. Very tough race. And the favor's three to one. The longest shot is 10 to one. That is the definition of a wide open race, at least in terms of betting. Yeah, that biggest price on the board, the seven Desert Dalliance for Rudy Rodriguez. Ruben Silvera already with a win today. We'll be back aboard for Rudy here on that three-time winner who was not you know, that far off Royal Poppy in Taming the Tigress when they met last time out with a poor beginning as well back on January the 11th. Favorite, though, right now, and it's changing back and forth with the entry and the five, though. The five right now, the favorite. Royal Poppy, Ray Handel. Dylan Davis meets leading rider, seventh from Aqueduct. Let's go upstairs. Chris Griffin, the call. Royal Poppy. Toehead to the outside. In it. All set. And they're off, and Toehead just stood in the gate, hopped in the air at the start, and it's already about eight, ten lengths of the trailer. Give Me Kisses has early speed. It's Give Me Kisses, and Desert Dalliance is right there on the early kick. Stonewall Star is at the rail and in tight in the two-path. Royal Poppy's going to hold that position. Four across the racetrack, no easy leads. The trip comes for Tough Street. Manny Franco tracking right in behind the battling quartet sits there in fifth. Then comes Taming the Tigress in front of Buston Bay and a tall task for Towhead after that bad start is the trailer. 23 and three for the opening quarter mile. Stonewall Star in front. It's Stonewall Star who's ahead in front. Right to the outside here is Royal Poppy. Tough Street found the seam and Tough Street continues to progress. Is now encouraged to move forward. Taming the Tigress is trying to follow that move as well. Desert Dalian still in there. Give Me Kisses has lost a touch of ground. Here comes Buston Bay trying to rally on from the back and Towhead. Still the trailer. Stonewall Star and Royal Poppy. They continue to go at it. They are head and head. They went 47 and 4 for that half mile time. Now Tough Street is going to tip towards the outside. Goes to an outside running path. And on the front end it's Royal Poppy who secured the front. Royal Poppy has taken the lead from Stonewall all star but had to really work to get there tough street with every shot to run this leader down can royal poppy fend off tough street for a final furlong bust in bay tips towards the outside as well it's royal poppy with a 16th left to go tough street just not making up the ground quick enough royal poppy almost there royal poppy game and victory royal poppy wins it over tough street bust in bay taming the tigress and give me kisses in one minute 27 seconds flat it's good effort here from royal poppy forward early, puts away the speed, and holds off the closer here, Tough Street. I agree. I thought she ran very, very well. She put my horse, Stonewall Star, away, um, and she was she was resolute. Tough Street, Manny did a good job getting Tough Street into position behind the leaders, but he had to ride her a little to get there, and for a closer, maybe he took away a little of her clothes. I'm not saying he made a mistake, but I think he had to get into that position, and Tough Street ran well, finishing second, but she had the whole stretch to get by the number five, Royal Poppy. Royal Poppy won, and she was the best horse. She was the favorite, too. Good job by the public. Yeah. Her favorite with the two. Yep. Went off at three to one. We'll have those prices coming up. Uh, you'll find those prices actually switching over to the next network. We're going to wrap up our FS2 coverage. After a slight pause here, we're going to switch over to FS1. We have the nightcap coming up from Aqueduct. Features still to come from Oakland on our President's Day coverage. Catch us on FS1 after this pause. Welcome to America's Day of the Races on our FS1 coverage. Thanks for spending part of your President's Day with us on the program. It's brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. Greg Wolf, Andy Serling, New York Racing Association handicapper here in studio. We have Paula Duca out in Hot Springs. Richard Migliori downstairs as we still have one more coming up here from Aqueduct. And we're going to look a lot at this Triple Crown Trail, some of the races coming up. Important weekend next weekend. Um, we had some big races that transpired, including Sierra Leone, who we're going to take a look at, who won the Risen Star. Yeah, it's getting more closer to getting more and more serious horses, getting significant points towards the Derby. We're going to be about two months away from it soon, and next week, the richest prep so far, at least in this country, 
in the Rebel. Take a look at the upcoming prep schedule for that first Saturday in May. Yeah, the race is just getting more important, worth more points that will guarantee you getting into that starting gate. And here's what's to come. You see first on that list, the Rebel, February 24th. We will have live coverage of that race next Saturday from Oaklawn Park in a full field, Andy. 13 lining up, ABR race of the week, but there's one name that really stands out. Yeah, there is no doubt at least in my mind, that if Timberlake comes back and he's even able to run the race he ran as a two-year-old, much less improve on it, he will win this race. He is a better horse than these horses. Uh, this is his win in our Champagne on a wet track, and unfortunately, it looks like the weather will be good. But I really, you know, misunderstood how well he ran in the Breers' Cup when he finished fourth. I think he ran really well. I just think Fierceness ran such an exceptional race. People tended to overlook some of the others, myself included, where he was wide without cover last time. And in my opinion, if Timberlake shows up in this Rebel, they're all running for second. He said he got the same figure in that Breeders' Cup Juvenile buyer-wise that he did in the Champagne. His three-year-old debut coming up, trainer Brad Cox says, coming into it as, as good as he could hope, training lights out. Distance is always the question for three-year-olds. It's one of the main things you end up talking about. He does feel like Sierra Leone, who, who was the effective winner of the Risen Star, is not going to be a distance problem. You don't really know with the horses like Timberlake, but I am very confident in his talent. I think this is one of the best three-year-olds in the country. Debut of his three-year-old campaign, trying to get into that Derby starting gate. Coming up next Saturday in the Rebel, $1.25 million purse. More importantly, those points. As you take a look at Oakland's road to the Derby, catching freedom, Mystic Dan won on that wet day in the Southwest. And because of the weather, Southwest pushed back a little bit, and some of those horses that we probably would have seen in the Rebel going to wait for the Arkansas Derby. Well, it's a good thing, otherwise, they had to split the Rebel, <laughs> considering how many entered anyway. Yeah. And only Just Steele coming back. You always have confidence that Wayne Lucas will come back. He doesn't miss many dances. And Just Steele ran an exceptionally good race in the Southwest, especially if you feel like the rail was good. And I do feel that way. And I think Greg agrees. He ran very well to be second. Um, he's a really neat, hard-trying horse. But he's not beating Timberlake if that one shows up. We will have live on-site coverage next weekend again for that derby prep from oakland we're going to take a time out we're going to take a look back at this past weekend on the triple crown trail in the big easy sierra leone how about this three-year-old debut for chad brown's gunrunner colt from well off the pace on a wet track under the lights comes up with a victory we'll be back
Susan Stark continues to lead easily by six. King Post remains in second. Brand's time is third on the rail. They pass the eighth hole. Risen Star draws clear to a 10 length lead. King Post second. Brian's time on the rail is third. The winner of the Belmont Stakes, Risen Star. Son of the Triple Crown Champ Secretariat, Risen Star, 14 and three quarter length win in the fourth fastest Belmont time ever at the time in the 1988 Triple Crown to close it out, became a champion three-year-old as a result. I've been going to the racetrack for nearly 50 years, and this stands out as one of the single most impressive performances I've ever seen. And it's really a shame he never ran again after the Belmont Stakes. Arguably could have, should have won the Triple Crown. A very tough trip, went third in the Derby. Got a good setup when he won the Preakness, and this was a devastating win. It was a giant horse. I saw him once at st Stud in the late 90s. Um, and it's really a shame that he wasn't able to continue his racing career because he was a brilliant, brilliant racehorse. Now one of the great performances in Belmont Stakes history, and you could be there to witness history. Third and final leg of the Triple Crown this year will be held upstate New York at Saratoga. Get your festival tickets for Belmont Week now. Belmontstakes.com slash tickets and be part of the fun in yeah, Saratoga so. Springs. I'm, I'm planning on it. I'll yeah. be there with you. We'll see you there. Brisbane Star Stakes happened on Saturday in the Big Easy. And how about this performance from Sierra Leone? This is three-year-old debut. Tyler Gaffleone aboard for Chad Brown said, when I called on him, he just exploded. And he gave him an exceptional ride. First of all, he got good position. For a horse with no speed, he was a little squeezed early, but Tyler got him in decent position. He saved ground as long as he could in the turns, angled him out, got to the outside in the stretch, and ran down a very good horse in track phantom who was setting a very modest pace. I thought it was an excellent return for him. The race earned a 90 buyer. I don't want to get caught up in the speed figures. His first star is a three-year-old. It was a messy track down there. And this is a horse that a lot of people have had him high in their lists, and there's no reason not to have him high in the list. Now, I think if you took six to one on him in the Derby Futures pool, you might be a little nuts because he could come by, win the Bluegrass and still be four to one in the Derby. But he's a good horse and a major player. And every time we see trainers, you know, have a nice horse like this and put in a performance like that, especially three-year-old debut, you start talking about it. But is this now Chad Brown's maybe best three-year-old he's had heading up to the Derby? Well, I mean, Good Magic was very, very good going to the Derby, and it was only Justify that kept him from winning that race, and there's an argument if he had drawn outside of Justify in the Preakness, he might have won the Preakness and kept that one from the Triple Crown, but he seems to be right up there with, you know, his best chances to win it, and especially this year, where Nysos looks like he might be the best horse, he's not going to be allowed to compete, and Fierceness is so up in the air after his disaster in the Holy Bull. He's still out there, and we know somewhere he's got the ability to be just a super talented horse but I think Sarah Leone is very much in the conversation with the best horses and I know Chad's excited and he had been training very well coming into the race yeah Chad Brown had been experimenting with his horse with, with bits and blinkers trying to figure things out he went with at the end of the day um, a small cup blinker to get it more focused you know early on settle and then be able to finish more and it seems like it did the trick in that race certainly meanwhile he's got more depth it looks like with a first time starter that looked impressive a million dollar son of twirling candy who won just a few days ago at Gulfstream in the debut. And he had worked very well with Sierra Leone earlier in his career. I don't know how close to this race. I know Sierra Leone had also been working with Domestic Product, who finished second in the Holy Bull, but this was a horse that Chad Brown was very high on, a million-dollar two-year-old purchase, and he was good. I mean, he broke from the rail at a mile, first time out, broke well, but Jose Ortiz sort of reined him in, got a little shuffled, got to the outside, and got an 86 buyer in his debut at a mile. That's not easy to do, and while he's not going to make the derby, you know, likely, and I can't imagine Chad being that aggressive, he is a three-year-old to watch. A little extra credit, too. Yeah, winning at, at a mile, first time out on dirt, that is not an easy thing to accomplish, so more depth potentially in this three-year-old division. Still a long way to go, even though it's coming up quickly that first Saturday in May. Oaklawn, Hot Springs, Arkansas race seven is next. Six for a long sprint. It's for state bread runners in an allowance optional claiming field. And we have a four to five favorite we'll get to 110 Stadium in a moment. We start with Macho Ronnie from the rail. It looks a little slow, to say the least. Three-time winner. But it's been a while since this one has gotten the picture taken. Blame JD comes off a win against Softer. To be honest, I'm surprised he's taking as much money as he is. This is a big move up off the claim. 
Citrus Bay, fifty-nine to one, the biggest price on the board. Yes, he he will blow up any any rate any bets he can include in if he does well. Horse to beat for the Ron Moquette Barn, one ten Stadium. I guess he doesn't look like a four to five shot to me, but I mean, I guess his last three races have been solid enough. Comes from off of it as well. Just a two-time winner from 14 starts. Reef's destiny, big number. Yeah, of course, who has to get faster. Meanwhile, Betty's cash was in similar spot last start. Did not show a lot. Could she clear and be the main speed in this race? She's I think that quick. could make her dangerous. Luis Quinones for Don Von Hemel with the six. Table money, Walter De La Cruz rides. Yeah, I mean, as a, a, a bit of a fringe player off the last race. And yeah, when Gate to Wire... In that dominant win, but yeah, that was softer. Macho Rocco at 701. I am betting this horse. This horse was four wide last time. It was the day of the Southwest, or that weekend, when, day of the Southwest when the rail was gold. I like this horse, Macho Rocco. Hess, first start. It was a win at Oaklawn. Slowish time, though. Going to have to get faster. And Allo Henry, 25 to 1 on the outside. Ramon Vasquez aboard. Another horse that probably has to get faster. Tried. The likes of 110 Stadium was well back of that now 4 to 5 favorite on the board. Let's bring in Paula Duca. So is it all about 110 Stadium here for the Moquette Barn, Pauly? Well, right now the public thinks that, right, at 4 to 5. And when you look at the numbers, yeah, 110 Stadium is the horse to beat. You know, the problem is when you have a horse at 4 to 5, do you want a horse that comes from off the pace or would you rather have a horse that's forwardly placed? 110 Stadium is going to have to pass horses here. That's just the bottom line. That's just the nature of the way he kind of, you know, runs. And, you know, I can understand he was fourth last time. He got left last time and, and, and made a, a middle move, but that's kind of his M.O. He's not a good gate horse. If he could break a little bit better, um, obviously puts him in a better position. There is some pace in this race um, to close into, but, you know, four to five, I, again, do you want to take four to five in an Arkansas bred race? You know, we were talking about morning lines. The morning line on the nine was just never happening at 20 to one. Randy Morris almost won the Dixie Bell, um, and his horses incrementally get better and better as they race. And I think the nine's got a big shot in here. I think she's going to improve um, in here, or he's going to improve in here off that win for Randy, for a son of Moonshine Mullen. And, and I thought the horse looked tremendous on the racetrack. The six Betty's cash, kind of the horse that's, you know, two for 12 lifetime, has shown speed in the past. What has happened to that speed the last two times? They went 21 and two. And in, in, in 45, this horse has gone sub 22 before. So if Betty's cash can really speed up this pace, it's going to help a horse like 110 Stadium. So I, I don't want to steer you uh, away from the four to five shot because I truly think he's the one to beat. But I'll tell you right now, the nine's going to fire a big shot here for Randy Morse. All right, Pauly, uh, we will see. Randy Morse, he's been having a very good meet. Uh, this is a big step up, not just because, you know, it's impressive to win first time out, certainly. Didn't do it that quickly. We'll see. I, 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 didn't, I don't get the nine. I respect Pauly's opinion. So, uh, His but opinion's uh, been great. Yeah, I, I respect him a lot. I didn't think this horse was in the hunt, but... Listen, I'm not. I have a great respect for him. I really like Macho Rocco in here. I think Macho 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 Rocco. His race two back is fast enough to win here, and he was wide against that good rail last time. I want him. Winner back in the seventh at Aqueduct Royal Poppy. Ray Handel, Dylan Davis, and Adelphi Racing. Yeah, this horse ran very well. Congrats to Connections as he was engaged in a, in a, in a, in a solid pace, and she was able to hold off. Tough Street ran well, but uh, she never closed. If you see how these two horses are 5-2 to two, and you notice they were 3-1 to one before, it's because the 8 was declared a non-starter. Yeah, let's take a look at the 8 here out of the gate toehead. You probably heard it during the running of the race. Far outside post, pre-broke the gate, and then rears up in the air. And as a result of that, declared a non-starter. Yeah, there you go. So you got your money back with the eight, and Toe will be back to fight another day. Nightcap still to come from New York. We'll talk more about it momentarily. For a moment, a four at one ten stadium dipped down to three to five. Yeah, I, I don't see this horse as an overwhelmingly likely winner. I, I think 
like you said to me, Greg, he's the horse to beat in here. Um, but I think Betty's Cash, if Betty's Cash shows the speed that she's shown in the past, I don't know what they were doing with her last time. Uh, maybe she's just falling apart. But I remember last time saying she was supposed to be in front and was surprised she wasn't because she's quick. If she's not, my horse Macho Rocco is going to wire the field in here. And Macho Rocco is exactly the kind of horse that I like. Now, I guess the one worry a little bit is it's an ex Robertino Diodoro horse. But the first race off the claim, and it was a month and a half after the claim, I thought was a race that was good enough to be competitive in this race. And, and, and then last time out was chasing four wide as the favorite on a day the rail was very, very strong. So he's an against the bias horse. And as a player, those are the kind of horses I like. And I know Paulie likes Hess, but I can't understand for the life of me how this horse is basically the same price as Hess. Just seems to be significantly Six better. Six-time winner versus, uh, look, not easy to win first time out. Was able to do that. Took some money, too, first yep. time out, the nine Hess. But this is a completely different ball game that he's in here. Facing some, for the level, much more accomplished horses. Yeah, Hess is, we'll see if he has talent. Yeah. I mean, he's taking money. The, the toughest race, well, people see a big win, and sometimes they're not really focused on the kind of effort it was. Um, and in my opinion, it was an effort that will get them absolutely nothing in this race. You know, you run in the optional claiming conditional state bred races, there's a tricky situation because you're running in sources that are entered for the tag, as you pointed out, that are multiple experienced winners. And this is a giant step up in company for the nine. Not a small one, a giant one. And, you know, I think a lot of people here have watched our shows and they're taking a look and handicapping these Arkansas bred maiden races. They're full of 40 buyer horses. And we showed you Cedar Run Farm earlier on the program. And this is a horse owned by Randy Patterson. He owns Cedar Run Farm. And we talked about this sire, two former grade one winner, Moonshine Mullen, one of the cornerstones of what they're trying to do, targeting this Arkansas breeding program. So we'll see. Exciting young horse who wins first time yeah. out for them with their cornerstone stallion. See if he can, Hess can keep it going. Yeah, I, listen, I wish them well. It's just I'm, I'm a better and handicapper, and, and I don't think this horse, I think this horse should be double the eight to one. But Paulie disagrees with me. And, and Paulie's opinion has been right on the entire meet at Oakland. So I have respect for that. But for me, I don't think this horse's effect is competitive on paper. I'm betting the eight. Back down to three to five on the four, 110 stadium for the very popular Ron Moquette barn. But just a two for 14 record coming in. See if he moves forward here, this five-year-old with Ricardo Santana Jr. in the irons. Matt Dinnerman, the call. Here's the seventh from Hot Springs. Stadium about to load in, post number four. Hess. Coming off a maiden win on debut for trainer Randy Morse, facing winners for the first time today in lifetime start number two. Hess goes in. Two back. Reef's Destiny. And Allo Henry to the outside. Here's Allo Henry. Citrus Bay, the rider, went out the back. Eduardo Gallardo just propped a little bit in there. Eduardo Gallardo right up on his feet. Looks like they're going to back out Citrus Bay, and the vet's just going to take a look at him. Make sure he's okay here. The health of our equine and human athletes atop them are of the most importance to all of us. And of course, the health of everybody who works with our horses. The vet gives us the green light to compete for Citrus Bay. The others waiting patiently in the gate. Citrus Bay coming back up. Reloads, we're ready. And uh, Laroff 
Betty's Cash going to the front. Table Money has speed. Macho Rocco on the far outside, up close as well. Macho Ronnie inside, the other gray advancing position. Blame JD off the pretty qu contentious pace here, running in the fifth spot. Three lengths ahead of Aloe Henry and Citrus Bay to the inside. Hess is next, well off the rail. Reefs Destiny second to last. 110 Stadium, the favorite at even money, dead last right now. Can only see backside, has to pass every horse and make up maybe be what 12 13 lengths at least in the final three furlongs around the far turn betty's cash on the lead here macho rocco on the outside applying the heat macho ronnie inside took back off of heels a bit is third coming to the top of the lane table money is next the gap of two to blame jdu's lost position 110 stadium has yet to pass a runner gets to the outside for the final three sixteenths macho rocco comes away with the lead down the lane here betty's cash trying to fight back his second and third blame JD re-rallying now. Macho Rocco in front. Betty's Cash tenacious on the inside. Betty's Cash reclaims the lead. Macho Rocco there. Betty's Cash determined and got it. Betty's Cash over Macho Rocco. Three-way go for the show, though. Citrus Bay blame JD in 110 Stadium. Don't think he got there for third, but he came on late. Betty's Cash with the victory, outdueling Macho Rocco for the victory. Yeah, I, I'm shocked that I lost this bet. I thought I was home free with Macho Rocco, who uh, looked to have the race sewn up, but base catch was not done and was able to come back. They really went 2172 because nobody really made up much ground in this race or any ground to speak of in here. And good give base cash the credit coming back and getting it done. Um, and the, 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 the overbet favorite was just way too far back in there. I had the exacta, but uh, a little win bet was a little disappointing there. Back to New York. Finale at Aqueduct here. New York Reds, $25,000 maiden claiming race. Nobody with a win in this field. All for sale for that price. Six for a long sprint. We do have uh, a rider change on the two. Sammy Camacho, after the wire and the gallop out, was thrown from his mount. And there will be a rider change here coming up. Favorite in this race, Andy, necessary and proper right now from the rail. Yeah, I, I'm surprised. This horse had a good trip last time out, and while I think he can win, uh, or she can win, I, I, I prefer others, but she's not a, impossible. Here she is again. So four career starts, three-thirds, including last time out, at this similar condition, but can be forward. Yeah, no, she should be sitting close. I think the eight's probably the speed, Snarky. We'll see. First-time starter, 30-1 to one here. Yeah, first are not taking any money. Mm, who knows? Zen Lu, the three, Rafael Hernandez, who we told our FS2 audience about earlier, new on the scene. Yeah, I mean, listen, nobody's going to have to run a Herculean race to win it, so if you like a price, go for it. Here's another first-timer by Salamini, who's being, been very good at stud early on. First foal from the dam, who did run a 71 buyer. Del Arte at 47.01. Pat Quick trains. Pat Quick looking for a second win today. A nice win earlier in the day. Drop in class for the five. At least there's that. The six, Miss Bourbon. Blinkers on. I like this horse dropping down and running against much, much tougher horses. I think makes a lot of sense. Mother Mary at 17 to 1. Apprentice Matty overrides. Yeah. I mean, listen, once again, I don't want to pick, you know, <laughs> she's got to get out of those 20 buyers, but uh, the race may be one with a 47 buyer. Lowest level snarky has been at yet. Yeah, I didn't get him, but he may be the speed, so that could help him out. Mangia, Randy Persaud Barn. Yeah, I mean, he's got races fast enough, so I think he has to be considered a contender. Five to two favorite right now. First time starter here for Bruce Levine, Majestic Laura Ann. And the dam was okay, trained by Gary Gallo, actually, and Bruce Levine, dangerous. I'm going to use this one. And a bit of a drop down, uh, debuted state bred, maiden 40 for the 11, Brooklyn Rosie. Gets a little throw in by me in here uh, at, at a price the second time out, but really didn't do any running first time out. That your field, three minutes to post. Nightcap on this President's Day card from Aqueduct. Let's go downstairs to Richard Migliori. Uh, yeah, guys, I, I think this is a very tough race to handicap as well. I was going to start with a first-time starter that really caught my eye, very well turned out, in number four, East Harbor. She's not taking any money. She's 19 to 1. But she, out of the first-time starters, made the nicest impression uh, in the paddock. Really well turned out for Rachel Sales. Uh, the six-horse, 
uh, is going to be my top selection, Miss Bourbon. She looks outstanding, and she's taking that, you know, serious drop in class from Maiden Allowance, Maiden Special to Maiden 25, and I just think she made a lot of sense, and 6-1 to one seems very generous on her. And the 9, Manja, your favorite, um, you know, she just looks good, carrying really good weight. Randy uh, Prasad's having a nice winter so far, and I, I, obviously she's a player, but I'm about the 6, Miss Bourbon. I just think the drop in class and how good she looks physically gets her home here. Well, she's able to be, you know, not on the lead, but at least forward against, against better company horses the last couple of starts. I like her, too. I'm with Richie, so. Six to one right now could, on the six. Could not agree more with Richie. I think There's she's a very dangerous player in here. I'm a little scared of the 10, the first-time starter for Bruce Levine. The horse has got a pedigree to be able to run a little bit. Bruce is a dangerous trainer with firsters, taking some money. It's a good spot to be having a firster because nobody here has done much running. I like the six. The same horse is Richie, but I'm using uh, a few in here, but the 10 is going to be one of them for sure. Loading up, necessary and proper, the one who was favored early on. Seven to two right now. Take a quick look here and how this card is gonna play out in terms of the pick six. So the, the two, the three, the seven. A little hard to see any of those, but could result in the pick six carryover. All right, we'll see what happens. We'll be back in action on Friday. Friday's card's pretty good, by the way. Not to say we're done yet. We have plenty more to go for, still coming up from Oakwan. Correct. Five to two favorite as they load up here. The nine for the Randy Persaud barn. Lowest level this one's been at. Was it a somewhat similar group second time out? But for this barn, this is the lowest this three-year-old filly has run. How many times a year do you think Randy Persaud runs the favorite? It can't be at a high number. No. Uh, especially with a seven-pound bug rider. Makes you take an extra look, doesn't it? No, I mean, I think the horse makes a lot of sense, has been running against better and sort of makes sense. <clears throat> just, you know, you just don't see Randy running the favor that often. Chris Griffin, this is the nightcap from Aqueduct, six furlongs, New York bred 25, maiden claiming race. Two out, Majestic Laura Ann and Brooklyn Rosie. Goes in. All set. And they're off. Snarky breaks right out for the front, and Snarky up by two, a quick two lengths. Necessary and proper is going to track from second as this leader gets away. Zen Lu is in that early mix, is tracking from third. Just got passed by Miss Bourbon towards the outside. Manjas to the outside of that row. Well, those four across the racetrack, very far out there. Brooklyn Rosie, as they're tightly bunched in behind the runaway leader, who's Snarky. Back towards the tail end of the field there comes Del Art, who's back there with majestic Laura Ann. They're followed by East Harbor, and at the rail, there's Frankie's Rose. The trailer, Mother Mary. Snarky is still in front, went 23 and 1 for that opening quarter mile. Snarky is trying to run them off their feet right now, but here comes Miss Bourbon, and Miss Bourbon is engaged. Manja's right towards the outside of that rival. Necessary and proper is under a full drive. At the rail is in fourth. They reach the top of the stretch. Can Snarky keep going? It's Snarky trying to fend them off. Miss Bourbon out in the center of the racetrack, and Manja joins on the grandstand side. Necessary and proper from way out of it. Zen Lu is making up some late ground as well. Snarky is still there. Snarky has not come back to the field yet. It's Snarky who's still holding him off. Can Snarky pull it off? Snarky is up by a length and a half. Here comes Zen Lu from out of nowhere, running out of time. Snarky's almost there. Zen Lu to the outside. Snarky needs the line. Snarky got the line. Snarky wins it, gives Ruben Silvera three on the afternoon. Zen Lu. That came necessary and proper in one minute, 16.57 seconds. Things were not looking good for Snarky early stretch. Somehow this one finds more and after five prior starts not hitting the board, picture time today. When you only have to go your last half mile in 53 and a half seconds to get the money, it kind of helps. I mean, this horse looked like he was completely or she was on empty top of the stretch about to be swallowed up swallowed up by the whole field sometimes rudy when he's going good they don't stop and she maybe she stopped the others just stopped a little more 23 and one and then 53 and change the second half and 
almost a pick six carryover as the long shot Zen Lu made it close, but could not catch the speed. Yeah, it's 16 to one, Zen Lu made a valiant effort, comes up short, it's snarky in this nightcap from Aqueduct. E5 Racing, Ruben Silvera. Speaking of good magic, I don't yeah. think this one is a good magic. Good magic, their two-year-old champion in these silks. Yeah. Um, they don't all pan out, do they? I, 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 my six horse couldn't have had a better trip. Sitting there, made the run, thought I was gonna win top of the stretch. I won't be betting Miss Bourbon back. I'll be drinking bourbon before I bet anybody back from this field. Eight, three, one, nine. Snarky, the victory to close out the card at Aqueducts. Still have the feature coming up from Oaklawn. We'll get to that when we return from a timeout. We'll preview next weekend coming up, not just Derby Trail, Oaks Trail as well. And a quick return band at Gold Ranges three weeks ago, winning at Martha Washington. Going to line up again in the great three honeybee at Oaklawn. Hey, 650, 650,000. War of Will, standing at Claiborne Farm. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions thrilling handicapping contest and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. This is Maxfield. This is a Maxfield foal. Maxfield, the G1 Breeders Futurity and G1 Clark hero by Street Sense. Maxfield foal. They're just like him. Walking, standing, looking perfect, and selling. This one made $500,000, the most by any freshman in 2023. Maxfield, he's the best in his field. Inquire now. Back at America's Day of the Races on our FS1 coverage. It's brought to you in part by America's Best Racing for the love of the race. Visit americasbestracing.net today. Aqueduct card in the books. Narky closes things out. Did not look like she was going to be able to finish the deal in this race. Able to find more mid-stretch. <laughs> the, the least and uh, Snarky was able to hold on and for this quality of worse a pretty quick first pay first quarter 23 and change and to think she came home in over 53 seconds the last half that's a tiring track but this will be a figure that will be hard pressed to buy her figure to be above 35 but if you better doesn't matter what the fig is 1280 get the win Ruben Silvera how about his president's day three victories yeah Teams up with Rudy Rodriguez here in E5 for the win. 8-3-1-9. So Aqueduct card in the books. Pick six over $4,800. Pick five just over $1,200. Well done if you put that together. We talked uh, going to break. Not just Derby Trail coming up, but the Oaks Trail picking back up at Oaklawn as well. And a filly we saw uh, run just a few weeks ago. She's going to wheel right back. But let's talk what happened Saturday first. The Rachel Alexander at Fairgrounds. And a new player on the scene with this performance. We expected talent from her, but this was the stakes debut. And Tarifa passes with aces. Last year, trainer Brad Cox had wet paint for Godolphin, who was doing well at Oaklawn. 
Uh, this one is faster and better. She's more adaptable. She doesn't isn't paste dependent the way wet paint was. She puts herself in position. She was six to one going in the gate. She was the co-third choice in doubles. And she paid seven dollars even as she cruised here. And whoever bet, they knew because she absolutely galloped. And you know, you hate to see these big preps being run on wet tracks. Um, and you'd like to see some fast tracks going forward, and you hope that's the case for the Derby and Triple Crown races. But I don't, I mean, Greg, don't you have to consider her one of the major, major players heading towards the Oaks at this she point? She was trending in this direction anyway. She has two big numbers, both on fast tracks, even in the debut. Keeneland, Church, uh, Fairgrounds as well, the race before this. And now it moves a few points forward, but who's not to say she would have moved even further forward on a fast track. She's yeah. going in the right direction, no question. And for a trainer who already has a couple of Kentucky Oaks wins, Monomoy Girl back in 2018, She Dares the Devil, that big upset in 2020. Now is another major contender as we look at upcoming Kentucky Oaks prep schedule. Honey Bee coming up next weekend on Rebel Weekend in Hot Springs and Band of Gold, one on that wet track for Kenny McPeak when he had that monster weekend sweeping those preps. 24 to 1, it's going to wheel right back. Yeah, um, I, I'm never surprised. Kenny and, and Wayne Lucas, a little sometimes come from the same cloth coming back. I, I want to see it again. Now, to be fair, she did rally out in the middle of the track on a day you want to be in a gold rail, but she spent, I'd say, about 75% of the race on the rail before angling out. She was impressive in winning. I don't, I don't want to knock her too much. I just want to see it again. And the good news is, the weather looks like at this point it's going to be very nice at Oak Lawn, so it'll get a fast track. And frankly, the horse that I'm most interested in the race is the horse who's finishing fourth in here, no matter how many times Greg tells me her name, or uh, actually finished third, Neon Beach, because she chased outside the whole way. So she's the one that I'm most interested, but Brad Cox may have the winner in here with West Omaha. Looks pretty good. Yeah, West Omaha, 84 buyer blitzing a field in the silver bullet day last time out by five lengths forward in that race and in every race for her has gotten better and better and better and brad brings her here because he wants to split her and tarifa up so tarifa won that one she comes here and i think she's going to be the favorite in here the well, morning line she could be 12 to 1 you never know yeah. i don't think she will be <laughs> they're a little off sometimes in hot springs uh coming up next horse suit three times has competed in the breeders cup sprint not just competed twice has been the runner up 10 year old cz rocket back in action in the next race ahead from oaklawn we'll be back with that right after this
Good to be with you on this President's Day. Thanks for watching America's Day at the Races. It's brought to you in part where you can play it all at Naira Bets. Bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Go to NairaBets.com and get that $200 deposit match new customer bonus with that promo code MATCH200. Nice shot of the infield at Oakland. Hopefully they're going to get some good weather coming up. They certainly could use it in the spring. Very good race coming up here in the eighth. Six for a long sprint, $62,000 starter allowance, knee deep in snow. It's been running some very big figures, been in great in stakes company in the past. McCrone's talented sprinter, but the horse we were talking about going to break, CZ Rocket, that is the four horse. Ten year old now, who twice has been the runner up in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. And he's still running effectively. I don't like his chances in here. I think his form is tailed off, but he's a pretty amazing horse. Meanwhile, the favorite edge to edge, this is a horse who two starts back ran a number probably good enough to put him in this year's Breeders' Cup Sprint. And he was also four wide against the gold rail in his last start. I believe he's the worst to beat. Kick things off here in a moment with knee deep in snow, Francisco Arietta. One of the leading riders at the meet will be aboard five-time winners, one over half a million dollars. Two years ago, he was second in Jackie's Warrior in the grade one Vanderbilt at Saratoga. Um, and his last race was a step in the right direction. That is serious company lines. Yeah. Not many horses make history at Saratoga. Jackie's Warrior was able to do that. Grade one winner at two, three, and four. No one had ever done that before. The question with this, this horse is, can he, can he catch up to those kind of figs? He's going to have to find it again. It's been a while since he's run that kind of race. And some of these, yeah, race. another race where it looks like, you know, horses who used to be very, obviously, he was in a grade one. He was a runner-up. They're not at that level anymore, but they're still very talented. Yeah. And we'll see. That was, first off, a long layoff for Knee Deep in Snow as well. That comeback race February 10th hadn't run since June of last summer at Prairie Meadows. So right now he is the Coast's second choice on the board in this race. So they make the turn here momentarily to kick off our post parade. It's always a long walk, a long, very slow walk. Edge to edge is going to be tough. I can make an excuse for his bad effort last time. And before that, he's running figures that are just too tough for these. Um, I think he's going to be very tough to beat in here. He is the favorite. So there's near deep in snow, eight-year-old second off the bench. We'll see if he moves forward. McCrone, this horse used to be very good not that long ago. Boy, has he lost his form, though, especially since being claimed. Ninja Warrior, six to one. Robertino Diodoro Barn. Yeah, and he's a horse that may not have liked the slop last time, so he's got races that give him a little bit of a sniff. Here's the two-time runner-up of the Breeders' Cup Sprint, 10-year-old CZ Rocket. Amazing, he's still running, and still running pretty well. Payne. Horse with some good credentials, won over half a million dollars for the winningest trainer in North American history. Yeah, at one time he was with Chad Brown as well, I believe, going way back. His last race was okay. Steve Asmussen trains his son Keith aboard. Derby date, blinkers on. Not sure where his race is that makes him competitive. He's a big price. Accidental hero. We'll see next. It's a huge price in three starts ago. He's a great at stakes winner. Yeah, up uh, in Canada. <laughs> He's cutting back in distance, I assume, yes. Horse to beat. Here he is, edge to edge. He is a tough customer. I, I, I can't see past this horse. To me, he is just better than these horses, and being able to make an excuse for his last race, I, I have no problem taking him. And Spankster, blinkers come off. Outside post with Julian Leperu. Sorry, I got a little distracted. Um, coming in from actually from out of town is going to have to improve at least and refine some once good form. A lot of horses near that were once okay that have just kind of lost that form, right? Yeah, there's some big credentials in this race, Polly. What about the 10 year old? Can CZ Rocket reach back and, and <laughs> find some of that former glory? Yeah, you know, it's pretty funny about CZ's Rocket. I forgot how big of a boy he is, even at 10. And, you know, of all the horses in the paddock, he just took it all in stride. He's just an old veteran that gets it. And, you know, his last win here was the 2021 Count Fleet, and he beat Whitmore. So that's actually pretty impressive. He has run here a bunch more times, but he's had a couple second-place finishes and some close finishes. Um, and, listen, he's, he's a neat horse to root for at age 10, and, and he's got $2.1 million in his bank. I'm with Andy you have to beat the eight edge to edge. You know, sometimes people will look at, at figures and they'll go, okay, the horse is going backwards. This horse has ran into Skelly in four of his last five starts. It's just an impossibility unless you're a quarter horse to get in front of Skelly in the first quarter of a mile. Edge to edge needs to get to the front end to do his best running. 
and Skelly is not in this race. Even in the three races back, Just Might came back to win. That was a quick race at Churchill Downs. So if the eight can clear, yes, he is going to be doubly tough in here. But, Greg, I do like the knee, knee deep in snow, the one. I think this is a horse that is on the edge of a win, you know, maybe gets a good trip. I thought it made a good appearance um, in, in the uh, – in the paddock at least and you know they started the source at six and a half furlongs in april of last year and then they went into to to into the next go this is another horse that's run better with lasix and has got some back class that i think is the only horse that can really beat the eight in here edge to edge and unless this race falls apart in here and i'm kind of with andy you know cz rocket i know he's an old veteran but can he run to those numbers of the you know the one in the eight and again you know, another older horse in here, but how about the nine-year-old Payne? I, I, listen, he come rolling up the rail at a mile. Maybe he'll come rolling late for some pieces in here, but I thought this race was 8-1 or 1-8. Uh, let's look at the eight edge edge. He is the horse to beat. And we're going to go two starts back against Skelly, who we believe he's won seven in a row. He's probably the best sprinter in the country right now, and he's amazingly quick. And, yeah, no one able to get to the front when Skelly's in the race. He tried to run him down. It's a tough task to do. He wound up second here. I agree. Now, I don't think he's going to make the lead, and I think it's an interesting thing that Paulie brought up. Is he a horse that you're comfortable with him trying to win from off the pace? I didn't look back. I did not look to see if any of his six wins were from off the pace. The two showing were on the front end. I don't think he's getting clear of the one and three in this race early. If he does, the race is completely over. Um, I think he's better than these, but listen, he's got to come back. He did not run well last time, but he does have a major excuse. And it, not just the sloppy sealed track where he doesn't do his best running, but also chasing wide. Anybody else? I, I, I'm, I'm all about the eight. The question is, you want to bet doubles, where the 12 is going to be the horse to beat in the last Patton's tizzy. And then you've got a firster taking some money, turquoise blue, for trainer Joe Sharp. Now, that four horse on your screen right now, that, again, is the 10-year-old CZ Rocket. And Paul talked about his earnings here. Over $2.1 million in the bank in what has been an incredibly productive career. And this was back November 25th, two starts ago at Del Mar, showing he's not the same CZ Rocket, but he can still win. No, I mean, he got it done. He was 9-5 to five that day, but he ran an 87 buyer. I don't think an 87 buyer is getting it done, and it's certainly not getting it done if the 8 runs his race. But maybe the 8 doesn't show up and run his race, in which case he definitely can win this race. 46th career start coming up. 2020 Breeders' Cup Sprint. Second behind Whitmore, seventh in 2021, and then 2022 he was runner-up at 31 to one. Yeah, no, no, that was behind Jack. Uh, that was behind um, Elite Power, right? It was. Yeah, no, that was um, that was impressive. Meanwhile, Payne, five horse for Team Asmus, and Steve is stunned. Keith will team up here on this seven-time winner. This was back on February 9th. We just saw him 10 days ago in a win. Quick wheel back here. I guess when the purses are this lucrative, <laughs> it's hard not to want, want to come back and run. Now, he got it done here. I looked up some stats for Steve Aspen because this race was a mile. Um, turning back on dirt off a win. Just 12 for 62 over the last five years, 19% $1.42 ROI, and he's done it seven times at Oakland with only one win. You don't see a lot of those cutbacks, but he did run well in his last race. I can't knock him. Uh, you know, listen, I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm going to keep saying it. If edge to edge runs his A race, he is going to win this race. And not, if not he even doesn't. In an A race that he ran two starts ago. Right, right. He runs his race two starts ago. Somebody's going to have to jump up and run a lot better than they've been running, um, in some of their cases, ever. Now, I know I'm bringing the Inting endorsements for the three to two shot. I'm not somebody who likes to do that. But on paper, I think this horse is a stick out. And if you can make an excuse for his last race, and some will say a wet track, and maybe that's the case, even going back, the sealed track races are not good. But I also believe chasing wide that day gave him no chance. Never been good on an off track, so take that for what it's worth. He was last away out of the gate, too. So a <laughs> horse that typically, you know, as Paul said, he likes to be on the front end. Um, that's not necessarily how he is anymore, but he at least likes to be forward and engaged. 
and drawing outside, he, he can stalk. Now, he's got to be comfortable rating. Like I said, I didn't go back far enough, and I apologize. He has won the two starts showing in his last 12 races when he was on the front end. Um, they love to circle at Oaklawn, don't they? Waiting for the load, yeah, coming up. And it's, it's edge to edge. We knew it was going to be the favorite in this spot. It, the more we look at that race, it just seems like there are excuses to say that's – and that's not who he is. This horse usually shows up, too. I don't even know if there's a lot of concern to say, well, is he not the same horse anymore? Right. He it's ran so well to back. I, I agree. Now, listen, if it becomes a pattern, it's a problem. And he's three to two. So you want to sort of – you know, you don't – we're not doing anybody any favors explaining to them why a favorite is likely to win. Doesn't mean you're against the favorite, but you want to try to find potential holes in their armor. And maybe one of them is he probably doesn't clear the lead, and maybe he isn't good without the lead. That's a potential problem for him. But I don't have a lot of reasons to not have reasonable confidence in him. Um, I do think he's best horse. And the other thing is... I don't think there are horses in this race whose current form suggests they're supposed to be able to beat him if he can run. If he runs the race, he ran two back. I think three to two is a is a, is an overlay. Well, second choice right now, knee deep in snow. Uh, it's a little bit intriguing from the fact he did that off such a long layoff, and if he moves Fair. forward, maybe gets him a little closer at least. Absolutely. I mean, he, he obviously has go-back races, and he's not impossible. He's down at the rail, so he's going to have to deal with the number eight, put him away, and then hold off closers. But I agree. He's obviously the second choice. He does have merits. No Feature on this President's Day card from Hot Springs. Six for a long sprint here from Oaklawn. And edge to edge, the eight, the big favorite for Chris Hartman. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman for the call. The millionaire CZ Rocket. 10-year-old. In fact, he's earned over 2.1 million. We're ready to go, and uh, Laroff, uneventful break for everybody in the race. Edge to edge on the lead here, Macron alongside, and Macron, the gray horse, along with Ninja Warrior. Ninja Warrior in the black takes a short lead. Macron sticks to him, and these two duel, opening up about three on edge to edge, happy to track from the third position. Knee deep in snow is next with the old pro CZ Rocket. Another length and a half to Spankster. He's nine lengths off the pace, approaching the four turn run. Derby date is next with Payne, and accidental hero at the rear around the fourth turn macaron and ninja warrior they went 21 and two fifth seconds they're flying on the oak lawn dirt here macaron the leader by just the neck ninja warrior hounding him edge to edge without being asked is getting closer by chris landeros he's ready to roll edge to edge looking good at the top of the lane edge to edge up to challenge ninja warrior macaron down inside now edge to edge is asked for his best ninja warrior keeps going edge to edge needs to finish but he's doing so now on the outside edge to edge ninja warrior has run a tenacious race on the inside edge to edge with the head lead now ninja warrior and pains coming up the inside three-way go and ninja warrior got it ninja warrior how game was he pain edge to edge in the photo for second macron fourth he wins last four starts for ninja warrior second off a long layoff Robertino Diodoro Barn. You're never surprised when Robertino Diodoro's horses run a little better than they look on paper. But we talked about a potential Achilles heel for the eight. He can't rate. Now, on the surface of things, you can't knock Chris Landeros. He sat behind a quick pace and he rated. But he needs to lead this horse to win. So in retrospect, rating him wasn't the right move. I'm not sure that going to the front, they were moving in front. You're supposed to, you're riding a three to two shot, he's supposed to be able to stalk like this. But I'm gonna tell you something, I wouldn't bet at nickel on edge to edge in any race where he can't get the lead. Because he hung like a chandelier. It's a bad loss for him. He One get second. Final time, yeah, it looks like he lost second as well. Ninja Warrior. Wow, Robertino Diodoro. Obviously one of the best trainers on the grounds out there at Oaklawn, usually in the hunt for a training title, starting to heat back up. A little, for, by his stand, by most standards, a great beat. But he's for his fire. standards, a little slow. Now he's really starting to heat up. Let's go to Pauly for more. Just cue me up, uh, Sarah. With winning trainer here, Robertina Diodoro with Ninja Warrior, Christian Torres at seven to one. 
Man, this horse showed some heart down the lane. No, no, he, he's a nice horse. He, his big problem is uh, the gate. You know, last time he got uh, left at the gate, he broke bad. And uh, as you can see on his form, there's a several times that, uh, again, he's his worst enemy at the gate. But uh, when he breaks, he's a tough horse. And, uh, man, he showed a lot of heart today, like you said. Jeez, gutsy win. Yeah, gutsy, gutsy win. And like you said, this is a horse that, you know, got off at 7-1. to And now Christian Torres, your main rider, who got off to a slow start. How much of a difference does he make in your barn? No, no, he's been great. I mean, a good guy, great rider, young. No, I can't say enough about him. Well, I hate to say this. You're way better dressed than me today, Robertino. Go get your, <laughs> your picture taken. Gets the job done here with Ninja Warrior and Christian Torres. Game, game winner here in the feature. It's a huge effort from this horse beating the likes of this field. I know some of these horses have seen better days, but I mean, Edge Edge is a serious runner, able to hold that one off. And now five wins, 12 career starts for this five-year-old. The more I look at him, the less I can believe he won this race. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say, but congrats. This horse really improved because he ran giant to win. Christian Torres for Robertino Diodoro, owned by John Holloman, son of Spitestown, with the victory here at 7-1 in the feature from Oakland. because you're not going to see this too often, maybe never again. Flight line, 20 lengths clear. World-class racehorse, world-class performance, and a world championship event. Breeders' Cup champion Good Magic by Sire of Sires Curlin was the sire of first crop Kentucky Derby champion Mage, one of three grade one winners to date, along with Muth and Blazing Sevens. In 2023, with just two crops to race, Good Magic ranked 21st on the general sire list with nine and a half million in earnings. Two-year-old sold for up to two million dollars, and yearling sold for up to seven hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Good Magic, the classic sire. With you on our President's Day coverage, America's Day at the Races. Thanks for being with us on FS1. Feature in the books out in Hot Springs, Arkansas, in this competitive sprint and a surprise winner, Ninja Warrior, one of the best trainers on the circuit. Robertino Diodoro getting this five year old going in the right direction. Career best effort from him. I mean, it, it, Diodoro is on fire. I think at this point, you have to upgrade every single horse that he's running. It's not that this horse was bad, because he's run some decent races, but this is an otherworldly effort by him. And yes, the eight hung like a chandelier, but he was right on top of that wicked pace that just buried the one who was the second choice, and he never stopped running. This was a tough performance to see on paper, but a very impressive one nonetheless. $17.60 for the win. Again, three wins in the last four starts. What a performance. Yep from this five-year-old as we get to the nightcap coming up. This is the race that's going to close things out on this President's Day card in Hot Springs. State bread runners, Arkansas bread, made in special weight, all looking for that first win. Six furlong sprints. And as the board reflects, it is wide open task, taking plenty of money, who was just second at this level last time out. We're going to take a timeout. When we return, more on 
This man right here was one of the major contenders in the finale coming up time and beyond. And he also has the best view of anybody in Hot Springs of the racetrack. Stay with us. My version of the clubhouse when you go to uh, go to the racetrack. I always think that the universe takes care of me, uh, but it's I couldn't imagine doing my job in the winter months without this this location. Ron Moquette built his hideaway along the Oaklawn backstretch in 2015. Three years later, he was diagnosed with sarcoidosis, an autoimmune disease that makes him especially susceptible to large crowds. He had no idea just how beneficial having Oaklawn as his next door neighbor would end up being. Let's go to this ride or something that he'll forget before he gets to the gates. And different riders are different. You know, Joe Talamo, he kind of warms up and hangs out until he gets there. If you miss Santana, you just miss him. He's just, he's a very hyper-focused guy. It takes a little to get used to because I like to watch the horses walk off whenever I leg them up and stuff. And you, know, you don't get to do that, but you get to watch them back here warm up. So it's, uh, you gain some stuff whenever you lose something else. Where's the horse? It's just a sloppy track. I was going to try to tell him to get involved and go on. They're off. Teams is the leader past the half mile pole. A two length advantage of the three guys who take second. Your third in the rail. They're from the inside now trying to get her. All of our dreams, Stargarita. Final surge, all of our dreams, and Stargarita. Third. Wow, this is an inch. Third. I but think I think if we get to the outside, she she's probably a lot happier. So it gives me a little good feeling that she might win here at the meet if we get a good trip. So. Uh, off of a year layoff, that's pretty good. Well, I wouldn't be in Hot Springs, Arkansas if it wasn't for Oakland. You know, I wouldn't be, ever go to Louisville if it wasn't for Churchill. I go where the horses go. And it's, Oakland is, is so endeared to me because Hot Springs and the surrounding area all share my enthusiasm for the horses and the races. We have the craziest, coolest fans there are. Paul, I, I know you know Ron Moquette pretty well and, and his family. Very good horseman, but uh, even a better person, he's impossible not to root for. He really is. I mean, he's, he's I think if he ran for mayor, Hot Springs, he, he'd have a good shot of winning. I mean, he's basically, basically the mayor here. 
when it comes to Oakland Park. And, you know, he was always vocal about his condition that he had during COVID. And, you know, he always talks about, I said, Ronnie, you know, the house you got over there, I said, you know, when Whitmore won first time out, I think at 16 to one, did you do well? He goes, hey buddy, I bought that house and everything I got over there from that race uh, when Whitmore won first time out. He just tells you the way it is. And he always has a beat on everybody here. If you need to ask him a question about anything surrounding Hot Springs, Ron Moquet is your phone book. It's just the bottom line. And a phone book that comes with a smile. His son Chance is a very, very good young man and becoming a good horseman too. Ron really starting to let Chance you know, lead the horses over more and more and starting to trust in his son. And he even told me in there a little bit, you know, Chance does a good job. Ronnie comes out here. He trusts in his help. And I think that's a big part about of it. Sometimes when you, you see a lot of owners and, I, you know, you bring up a guy like a Jerry Jones or somebody like that micromanage, Ron is never micromanaged, sort of keeps, lets his son do a lot of the stuff. But when he comes out here on the rail, his horses are usually live. And I'll tell you what, you know, Timberlake's going to be a giant favorite. I'm with Andy, a giant favorite in the Rebel. He, he, Ron got unfortunate because he thinks Time for Truth is one of his best horses that he's had in a while. And the horse drew the 13 hole. But I'm going to be rooting for that horse. I think the horse has got a little bit of talent. And I'm always rooting for Ron McQuet. Yeah, like I said, it, if you know him, it's, it's hard not to root for him. Such a good guy taking a big shot in this Rebel Stakes on the Derby Trail next weekend. Two sprints. Now he's going to stretch out. Great at stakes company for the first time. What do you think? I think if it's very hard because he's coming back two weeks after running very well and finishing second the talented Valentine Candy. I don't think there's any doubt that he's got a lot of ability, this horse. And looking like a steal is a two-year-old purchase for 47000 The problem is... Not only is he stretching out to a mile and a sixteenth off a six furlong race just two weeks ago, but he also drew post 13. And it just, to be honest, I won't be surprised if he scratches. Um, maybe they wanted to see what the race looked like. It was a race. There weren't that many horses that were guaranteed to run in here. And maybe the racing office, I don't know, came to him and said, would you look at it? And listen, it's 1.2 million. This is a huge ask for a horse, and I, I like Ron a lot. I wish him the best of luck, but I don't know how you can possibly imagine him being likely to be the winner of this race. Well, and even if, you know, he's good horse. you, you want to give your horse a fair shake, too, because you do yeah, not get a lot exactly. of opportunities on this Triple Crown Trail, even if he does not run in this race. You have a talented three-year-old. It's worth checking the box, so maybe we'll see him in another race down the line. Maybe. Or, you know, listen, he does have a sire who, who won the Arkansas Derby, so I could understand them thinking that perhaps he can get the distance. I don't know the damn side. I think you also have a pretty good sprinter, and there's some very good races for sprinters. So the last thing you want to see is bad experiences set a horse back early in Let's their career. Let's not forget who, who ran in the Kentucky Derby and became a pretty good sprinter from his barn, right. Whitmore. But a lot of horses don't rebound from those experiences. I like this horse. He's a nice horse. I, they, they got bad luck at the draw. I wish them only good success with this horse. And if he was able to be at all successful in both 13 in here, they've got a good horse in their hands. I don't see it. Well, this race coming up to close things out as well, Ron Moquette with one of the major players, the five time and beyond, who has been in against this level several occasions before, has has hit the board, ran a 61 buyer, beat less than two lengths March of last year at this condition. I, I think he's a ridiculous overlay currently at seven to one. He's second off a little bit of a layoff. He didn't have the best of trips last time. He's run figures to give him a chance. I don't have a problem with Patton's Tizzy. It's a very logical horse, but he's also two to one and he's got the far outside post, six furlongs or not. He's no great shakes. I think the five at this price is a much better bet, and you can't ignore the money that the eight turquoise blue is taking. It's really more of a turf pedigree if you look at it, but you got to think this is a very dangerous first-time starter for Joe Sharp. Well, meanwhile, the one who will ride for Ron Moquette on the five, time and beyond, young man who we've seen grown up right before our eyes here on the program. Four win Friday at Oakland, all for dad, his Hall of Fame winningest trainer in North American history is going to ride for the Moquette Barn coming up. Keith Asmus and Story next.
Olympiad leads American Revolution. Olympiad gets the gold in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. It's America's original sport. And no one covers it better than America's Best Racing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle. The best races, horses, and destination venues. Cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more. America's Best Racing.net is a sport for you. At Three Chimneys, our name is our promise. Our commitment to quality, our customer, and most importantly, the horse is at the heart of who we are. For over half a century, the storied stallion station and nursery have been a place where dreams are born. From Horse of the Year, the mighty Seattle Slough, to Horse of the Year and modern day breed shaper, Gunrunner, we've been defined these past 50 years by the company we've kept. Three Chimneys, where dreams are born. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on every screen, every, screen every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. such a privilege coming from a family of jockeys that they understand the trials and tribulations of being a jockey and what it takes mentally and physically. When I first started, it, I, I wanted to ride one race more than anything. And this kind of snowballed into something that has you know, blown my wildest expectations. And it's Ian Glass fending off all the challenges and he'll prevail going away too. Today, the Asmussens are better known for training thoroughbreds thanks to the accomplishments of Keith's father, Steve, who was the only trainer to win 10,000 races in North America. It's impossible to explain how much fun it is. I mean, I've been unbelievably blessed in horse racing, and I think a lot of it is, you know, growing up with my dad rode, you know, and then my older brother rode and stuff, so the excitement of that and then to get to relive it with your, with your kids is uh, unbelievable. I imagine he's got an immense uh, source of pride from it, given that he is, you know, other than horses, taught me about everything I know. You know, grew up around the racetrack, handicapping races. Hometown Arlington, Texas, 20 minutes away from Lone Star Park. Obviously infatuated with jockey as a profession growing up, just having known my, my father and my uncle and my grandfather, who were all jockeys. Keith Asmussen's mother, Julie, was an accomplished rider in her own right. She competed in the rodeo event, barrel racing, through high school. And his younger brother, Eric, is the latest Asmussen to forge a path as a jockey. Keith and Eric have already ridden on the same card at several racetracks, just like their uncle and father did at Aqueduct in the 1980s. It was always, you know, a dream, but I would go as far as saying like a pipe dream of being a jockey. Just, I mean, probably seventh grade, I was about the same size I am now, so I thought I was gonna blow right by it. It was Keith's height and weight that steered him towards a more typical career path after graduating from high school. I applied to the University of Texas and I got in their business school. I'm an accounting major. I have a five years master's degree in professional accounting. And it wasn't until my junior year at college when COVID hit, 2020, that when classes went online, I came to work here at Oakland because I'd already you know, poked my father quite a bit about, you know, is it possible I could ride a race? Before I even rode, my parents made me promise that you know, so once you start, you're not going to want to go back to school. you got to promise you're going to go back to school. And I kept that promise, and I went back for two more years, and I got my degrees. And as soon as I graduated, I went straight to the racetrack. Rivet has won his third straight, and Keith Asmussen has an Oak Lawn Stakes victory. Keith James Asmussen is named after his grandfather, the family patriarch, who rode quarter horses for 38 years. In fact, grandfather and grandson both won a race for Hall of Fame trainer D. Wayne Lucas, 54 years apart. These two to the wire, Papa Rocket. I love being a jockey. It's such an incredible feeling. There's nothing like the feeling of being on top of a thoroughbred racehorse at full flight. And you know, when you add the art of race riding, it's, I mean, it was such a spectacle watching it growing up and just being so attracted to it and then being able to actually do it. It's, it's beyond words. 
been such a cool story seeing Keith Asmussen really just blossom on our program. We've got to see him grow up. As you look at the jockey standings, he's had a terrific meet. Third right now with 21 wins. And this initially for him was just going to be some summer fun. And now it's turning into a career. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think you can say enough about watching him blossom as a rider because I'm going to be honest, when he first started riding, even his dad didn't ride him that much. They were horses I think his father owned. And he wasn't very good. I remember seeing the beginning and sort of commenting with you and saying doesn't rise well as some of the other Aspersons. And it's like he turned it around in a matter of weeks, if not a month. I mean, it's amazing. And you could see it. He went from being somebody that you didn't want to bet on their horses to being just a good rider out there. It's really been impressive watching. And that's that's a real credit to him as well. Bet all the gold kicks off our post parade. Second time out, we'll get Lasix. Not taking any money and no reason he should. Barra, Barra, Barra. Rafael Bejarano, blinkers on. Yeah, second off. I mean, this horse is not impossible for a 10 to 1. Sean's last race wasn't that bad. Showed speed last time out. Welcome to Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he did show speed. It feels like could do it again, but tough spot. First time starter, the four. Hey, look at me. Just taking no money. But actually, after worse, they ran a 99 buyer. Here's the young man. We just showed you the feature on Keith Asmussen for Ron Moquette. I, I think this horse is a very generous price if he stays around his current six to one. I know he's had chances, but he he makes sense second off. A the race two sense. back from the six. Does that make him a player? I, I think it makes him at least a fringe player for a horse who's 23 to one. First time starter of the seven, did you? The only thing that catches my eye with him is, is Ricardo Santana riding him. Is a first foal from a dam with no running. Turquoise blue for the Joe Sharp Barn. First time out. I will not ignore the money this horse is taking. Strike Ridge, Chris Hartman Barn. Yeah, not getting bet, so probably not a good sign even for this barn. 51 to 1 next door. This is Bo Nugget. His first time out was 86 to 1. Yeah, he's taking a little more money today, but he didn't do any <laughs> running last time. He may be 86 by Bo Stuff. Yeah, it beat more than 23 lengths. Here's Task, current favorite. Sorry, 4 to 1, second choice. You know, he's okay. The, last, or the winner of his la last race was that horse, Hess. Now, he didn't know running the other race he was in, but he had no chance in there. And here's the favorite. Brad Cox Barnes, second time out, took money in the debut as well. He did. The fifth horse in that from his last race came back and, and won with a 17 buyer improvement. They were, mo they were really mostly first time stars. You can look at the horse who finished second. That's Rocket Sanders, who was 13 and scratched. Now, he was a 40 to 1 first time starter. I have no argument with him. I can see why he's favored. I think he could very well win. But does he really look like a two-to-one shot you want to bet in this race, breaking from the far outside? I would much rather bet, frankly, I would bet the five is six-to-one, or I'd bet the first or the eight. I'm going to make a little five-eight box. How's that? Well, Paulie, we know Brad Cox usually attracts attention whatever he sends out, especially in hot springs. And right now he has the favorite with the 12. Yeah, he does have the favorite with the 12. But when you look at, you know, a lot of the races, at least of what I've covered the last couple of years, Greg, you know, with these Arkansas breads, especially any, if you're going any kind of distance to ground or if you're going, when you got that outside post, you just got to be much the best. So I can understand where Andy's going with the 12 in here and Patton's tizzy and maybe fading against this horse at two to one. Um, you know, Task in here, the 11, you know, ran well last time. I mean, I know lost to Hess. Hess ran, I think, fifth or sixth in that race. But it was, you know, 24 to run. And then last time out, you know, Christian Torres, you could argue maybe Task was the best that day. Um, but he came rolling home. Now Harry Hernandez is in the irons uh, today because, uh, you know, the eight goes to Christian Torres. And, you know, when Andy was talking about, uh, you know, to Joe Sharp runner. Usually when Joe Sharp's first time starters, they take money. There's been a little buzz on the racetrack. Uh, the son of Air Force Blue um, and Arky Bread, they pay 24000 He gets 8% winners, but this horse does have a bullet drill on the mud. It's been working okay, some some gate drills. And then the slowish work in the last one might just indicate it's go time from there. So I, I understand where the public's going with the three favorites. I like a little bit of a long shot. I, I do like do you think the five is another player in here for Ron Moquette? Keith Asperson seems like he wins for his father and Ronnie. I'll tell you what, the three in here, welcome to Arkansas. And this might be welcome to an Arkansas bred race because sometimes these races blow up with prices. This horse showed really improved speed last time out. Off a long layoff into that race of tasks that actually just sort of fell apart. I think this horse can get to the lead with Walter De La Cruz aboard. And at 23 to 1, the way... This racetrack's been playing in fast fractions. 
I think he's worth a look here at a big, big price. All right, Paul, thank you. So, yeah, an alternative choice to go with here. This three horse, 27 to one. That horse who did show, at least, if nothing else, improved speed last time out. No, I, 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 I think that's very fair by Paul. His first time against Darkie Breads and really didn't run that bad. He doesn't look like a 27 to one shot to me. I'll put it that way. I mean, I, I'm not, I think that's what Paulie's getting at. He's not saying he's a likely winner, but he is a horse that's probably too big a price in here. Three to two now on the 12. I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's Brad Cox, but, you know, Brad's not exactly lighting it up there. <laughs> I'm winning at less than 20%. There's nothing wrong with that. But my... And you got to think, too. I mean, look, the, the core of his stable, too, he's not had these Arkansas bred runners. <laughs> these no, you're usually right. don't have these massive standouts in these state bred races. No, Eight I... to five. It's almost default money, isn't it? A little bit. I mean, they're going crazy for him here, and it's a big field. And I, I, listen, he ran a solid figure, but he didn't run that much faster than the horse inside of him. And I think Ron McQuett's horse, I mean, I think I think the odds right now in the five are sort of too high. Um, I know he's had his share of chances, and he has been short prices in some of those races, to be fair. But I think in this race, it's a, it's a very it's a very fair bet at six to one. It's got three races faster than the three to two favorite. And granted, that was the debut for the twelve. He has every right, especially from that far sure. to move forward. But dealt that far outside post. I just don't feel like if you're betting horses like the twelve at three to two, you're making money in the long run. It's just me. Other people may think he's just a second time starter who'll improve. It's Brad Cox. He'll get it done, which they may, may have right. But uh, I don't know. Well, going back to Paul's long shot, that three. Welcome to Arkansas at 25 to 1. Who else projects to be on the pace with him early? Um, well, I think the five is going to be forward. I know he wasn't last time, but he had some early trouble in there. He could be forward. I'd love to see Keith be a little aggressive. I'll tell you anything else. I mean, you'd, you'd think the 12 is probably from there. Concepcion's going to have to go to get position from out there, else he's going to get himself in trouble. So I think he's going to be aggressive as well. Finale on this President's Day card from Hot Springs, Arkansas, ninth from Oaklawn, and it is the 12th. For the Brad Cox Barn, Patton's Tizzy, the favorite, Keith Asmussen, and Ron Moquette, for that matter. We showed you features on both those two. They're teaming up with the five, time and beyond. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman for the call. Bo Nugget just went into the gate. Cass goes in. Welcome to Arkansas. Cooperates goes into the gate as well. A few more runners to round out the field. Hey, yeah, uh, look at me. Time and beyond. Secret strategy in Patton's tizzy. So there's four more runners behind the gate. Hey, yeah, uh, look at me. A little bit rambunctious behind the gate at the moment. Hey, you look at me working with that runner to go into the gate. Now he's in. Time and beyond. Two back. Secret strategy. And to the outside. Patton's Tizzy, your current 8-5 to five favorite. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off in the finale. Beautiful start from the first, or Didja, who's sent out of there hard and grabs the lead. Didja's on top from Patton's Tizzy and Strike Ridge to the inside. Bet all the gold is moving up, and so is Welcome to Arkansas. Now it's Bet all the gold up to challenge Didja on the rail and has the lead. Bet all the gold. Didja now a half length back concedes the lead second. Welcome to Arkansas third with Strike Ridge and a 3D Patton's Tizzy. Time and beyond off the pacemakers today into the four turn run is seven behind into that turn. A length and a half better than Burrow.
burra, burra, burra. Turquoise Blue sent along. Hey, you look at me losing position. Pass by Task on the outside. And a gap of three to Secret Strategy. The trailer is Bo Duggett as they round the fourth turn. Bet all the gold. That's all for him. Didja finds himself in front once again. Time and Beyond's coming with a run. Patton's Tizzy alongside of him. Time and Beyond way out in the center of the track, but is gaining good ground on Didja, who's still in front. Time and Beyond second. Patton's Tizzy flattening out in third. Task trying to roll late. It's still Didja in front. Didja by two and a half. Time and Beyond. Task is rolling home down the outside, but Didja's still clear, and Didja wins it at six to one. Photo for second. Task and Time and Beyond. Patton's Tizzy checks in fourth of the nightcap. Where did this come from? Wow, first time starter, 16 to one. Did ya for a barn that only sent out six winners all of last year? As I said to you, I was surprised to see Ricardo Santana riding it. The horse really took no money. And they got the money here, congrats. I'm always impressed by people who get the money. My five horse ran well, I think got nipped for second. Looked like he was gonna win. He swung wide in the stretch. He was a good bet at five to one. And the 12 was awful, awful. And the eighth, the first I was talking about, did he ever make a sniff in here? Tight for second. Maybe the 11. Yeah, it looks right like the, the 11 may have nailed time and beyond. Who, yeah, again, had to go very wide to try and chase this yeah, first time starter. He wasn't, he wasn't way the first time star was much the best. Boy, I tip my hat to people who get the money with the first turn, and I am fairly certain. I cer I'll put it this way. I hope they got the money. I hope they cash. When you win with a first or like that, you better cash. Man who put together, what, eight consecutive riding titles at Hot Springs? Ricardo he's... Santana Jr. showing up there? Yeah, I mean, obviously he's not in the same spot he was a few years ago, but I agree. I noticed that, but there was no pedigree and horse no money. They got the money. Good for them. Tough one to find. Closing things out. 16 to one shot. First time starter wins the finale next weekend. We will have live coverage on Fox Sports. Great to rebel on the road to this year's Kentucky Derby. Mile and a 16th, $1.25 million purse, and this race seems to go through Timberlake. Three-year-old debut coming up for this talented Brad Cox horse, who is a great one winner of the Champagne on that wet track. Had a great ride here, a good trip, moved up in the rail, angled out, beat a nice horse and general partner. Very impressive performance, and his Breeders' Cup while fourth place finish was also very good. He never was able to get into a comfortable spot. He was always wide without cover. He ran a solid fourth in there. And listen, we'll see if he's a horse that gets better or is able to be as competitive with distance. If he has improved at all from two to three, he'll trounce this field. If he's the same horse he was, he'll also win. Uh, I, I'm not trying to beat Timberland. Uh, Timberlake. I've looked at the race, and I just don't see the horse in there that can beat him. I thought Just Steele ran well last time, but... Uh, After his last workout, his trainer, Brad Cox, said he's big league. <laughs> Sounds like he's excited of what we're going to see next be. weekend. Meanwhile, D. Wayne Lucas, he will send out Just Steele, who is a stakes winner sprinting at Churchill Downs. Does have some derby points already and was just second to Mystic Dan on that wet track in the Southwest. I'm laughing because when they ran the Southwest, half the race you and I were talking and said, well, you're not going to come back in the Rebel. And then we both sort of looked at each other and said, Lucas will. <laughs> and what about, about Wayne? He does not miss a dance. Not many are missing this dance. Huh? 13 lining up for the Rebel despite the presence of Timberlake in this race. Big and money. you never know what's going to happen in these preps. Big money. And even second place finishes were two, what, about, uh, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. So so why not take a shot and run in there? As you say, you never know what's going to happen. You can have a chance. We'll see what happens. But I'm looking forward to seeing Timberlake back because the horse has not gotten much press. And he could easily be a big player in the Derby. Even a runner-up in this race with the points being given out probably has enough points to get into the Derby most years. A lot of, a lot of ways to go. And the check for second money ain't so bad either. We are back next Friday. We will see you then. 3 Eastern start time coming up next on FS1, NASCAR Race Hub. We'll see you next week. Important week again on the road to the Kentucky Derby. Hope you enjoyed the program. Timberlake back in action. Grade 1 Rebel, he'll be the big favorite. Grade 2 Rebel, excuse me. But $1.25 million on the line. Just steal. We'll go postward for D. Wayne Lucas, as we just talked about. Can he spring the upset, stretching back out in distance? Enjoy the rest of what's left of this long weekend. We will see you on Friday.